I am one of those layman pascals you've heard about, and this is the Integral Stage Meta Podcast, where we podcast podcasters and start conversations with conversation starters, especially those who've been trying to use digital media and other online arenas to bring forward their insights and instincts about transcendental, developmental, and meta-level reality. Helping me think through all this today is my favorite servant of the great multidimensional alien praying mantis god, Stuart Davis. <laughs> it's good to behold your countenance. <laughs> um, maybe you could tell us, in general, um, about some of the experiments with integral digital media that you've tried and where people could check those out. Yes. So, let's start with the one most in the heart of our concerns for this conversation today, which I feel would be aliens and artists. Uh, it's percolated for a long time. It originally was conceived as a TV series and we were migrating our way toward that, a documentary, pretty old school approach. I'm a fan of the documentary form in which the personality of the presenter is not in the mix and you go with that more maybe traditionalist BBC approach or whatever it might be. But so that's what we were conceiving of this series being a TV documentary, simply telling the story about what happens to the creative life of artists and more generally just human beings and their creative capacities when they have contact with non-human entities in the very broad sense. And so certainly that includes the conventional menu that we're familiar with, grays, mantids, tall whites. We begin to flush it out from there. <clears throat> Sean Esbjorn, Esbjorn Harkins has a real nice lexicon of those for people that want to make a reference. They probably already have if they're tuning in here today. And then, you know, further in the borders, angelic uh, theurgy themes coming in from now and then. So we had a real broad sense of just anything non-human intelligence. How does that impact human creativity? And what's the untold story there? Because I, the more that I began to look into this, I personally felt this is a strange and compelling and very old story. And it doesn't feel to me like it's been unpacked in a very rich or satisfying way. And of course, some of that is selfishly braided with my own life because I'm an artist and I had experiences and I was trying to understand them. And then one of the things we naturally do is try to talk to other people who've had those experiences and just begin that inquiry, that mutuality helping sometimes to have more than one intelligence, almost always helping to have more than one intelligence. So that was going to be this TV series and we were getting there. We were going to start filming in early 2020, COVID hit and everything just in the TV and film world, like everywhere else, it just cratered and disorientation and confusion remain prominent to this day and probably will for the foreseeable future. And I immediately just felt like, you know, I'm going to be in my house for a year, at least. I'm going to be why don't I just do this podcast? I do it as a podcast. It's such a great opportunity in it. Making my audio documentary, Man Meets Mantis, activated a, an appreciation and a deep enjoyment of an audio form, which I had been strangely blind to or had not had it on my radar because I'd been working in TV and film stuff for so long that I just thought, this is amazing. This is so gratifying and wonderful. And it's a great format for this. So that's the long story of how we got to Aliens and Artists, the podcast. I think we've got about, we're releasing our 20th episode this week. And we're certainly going to do at least 100 episodes. And I don't even feel that 100 episodes will begin to get into the depths that we could and perhaps will but I've committed to 100, then let's see. Then beyond that, I had just have a bunch of other digital visual medium projects. Some of them include films in various stages of development. Uh, three of those films, four, four of those films are really in the pocket of what most of what you and I will discuss today, I'm sure. And then I also have comedies, shot a TV pilot last year that's a comedy and um, I'm working on various painting projects and I just have a wandering, promiscuous kind of 
curiosity and creativity and I'll, I'll get into whatever's in front of me for a while and then forget about everything else for a few months. That's been both an asset and a liability <laughs> through my life. So does that make sense as a general frame up? Yeah, that's a great overview. Good. Um, though I noticed on your website, you don't do sculpture. Well, are there other, sir, are there, allow me to seem present very you uh, promiscuous relative to creative media. Yeah. Um, other than sculpture, are there some that you're just not very interested in trying to get your perspectives across through? Well, I'm a terrible dancer. I have never, you know, my daughter's a ballerina and maybe you share this interest. I do find myself, the older that I get, more fascinated with the things that I can fail at very hard. For instance, I tried jujitsu and it was the single most humiliating failure of my life, not because of the fellow practitioners, they were wonderful and supportive and loving, but I just was so utterly incapable in jujitsu. And then I found that counterintuitively gratifying and fulfilling to other parts of my life. It, it fed other passions in a beautiful way. So I also studied ballet with my daughter, uh, who's, she's a Bolshoi ballet pre-professional 13 year old who dances seven days a week and is just like it totally in her element she gave me ballet lessons for quite a while and <laughs> again the the experience of doing something that i'm so awfully incapable of made me feel such appreciation and wonder. It renewed my sense of wonder for what she does do with it and then this uh, newfound sense of enchantment with ballet. So that's a long answer to say like, there's a lot of stuff that I'm really interested in and would love to do, and I'm never going to be good at it. Sculpture being one of them. And, and then you also get, I mean, maybe you want to share some of your, I, I have come to call this the integral malady. So that when you get into the honeymoon and later of your integral experiences and you realize oh my God, the sum total of the cosmos is available as a palette. I could do every, let's do everything. You just get this and then a, right, a flux comes through of this geyser of possibilities. And then there's years where I just wanted to do everything and have tried to a degree. And then that subsides. And then I realize, well, if I'm going to do something deeply, I'll have to forego these seven or eight other items. Have you had that experience? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's phases where I'm ravenous in terms of my options uh, and you, you gain, I think you gain a capacity because the, the map and you know, the, the map that it suggests to you is so vast that you can basically see how it would apply to almost everything. Yes. I start watching a Hitchcock movie and you're like, wait a minute, I see how this applies. I should <laughs> think about this. You know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, there, there's at the same time, there's a uh, for me, um, a kind of verification process, which is something I learned maybe as a kid or maybe before that. Um, there's a flavor when something is really mine, right? And I'm like, yeah. I, I, there's a lot of options and I go through them and they're interesting, but it turns out they're not weird enough, like they're not peculiar mm. enough to be something only I could do. And those are the ones that I think are worth my time. And those are the ones that are going to give me a hit. And I feel like move me a step forward. Yeah. What are your greatest hits in the strange enough category? Uh, well, almost everything I do. Like the most recent thing was Bruce Alderman asked if I contribute to his utopia project. So I'm going to give a talk on utopias. I'm, I'm start thinking about it. And, uh, I start thinking about this video I'd seen one time where someone had taken William S. Burroughs and added dub music behind it and had him read his stuff. And I thought, you know, I love that. That's so far out of the box for what's going to be included in the Integral Stage Utopia series. I should do something like that. And I thought, you know what? I could easily do that. I could do a William S. Burroughs voice. We can film it in black and white. I can you wear do. a suit. I can yeah. swear all the time and be cynical like he was and yet throw in all of my ideas. <laughs> I start to get some ideas about how it could be edited. And I thought, after I thought about it for a while, I thought, this is, I just personally think that's so beautiful. Someone should do that. And the only one who can do it is me. Yeah. And all the other things somebody else could do. Yeah, exactly. That's such a great way 
to move through that process. And I think that arrival point is the beautiful outcome of like how integral can bring coherence and specificity to that great florid infinite potential. I had a similar arc with arriving at aliens and artists because when I looked at UFO ufology and just the broader umbrella of the non-human entity contact and people's exotic experiences, historically, the modern, everything that's going on in the last three years with TTSA and the, you know, the quasi movement towards disclosure, which may or may not be. But I had the same kind of question, which is, well, I really don't have anything to bring to the conversation uh, of what I love about Jacques Vallée's work or what I love about Richard Dolan's work or what I love about six or seven of my favorite researchers they've done. And I'm grateful for that. And then even looking at Sean S. Bjorn Hargens putting together exo studies, which is something that I felt for a long time needed to exist. And honestly, I didn't want that job. I, I cringed when I thought of getting that job and just like, oh my God, how that would eclipse a person's life. So desperately wishing it to exist. Please don't let me be the one who has to do it. So it wasn't until when I began to investigate the aliens and artists domain and I so, I so intimately recognized the experiences these artists were having, the process and almost as though stages of development, stages of progression began to appear to me and some topological outlines in the landscape of what artists and these non-human entities, the nature of that duality. That's when I started to say what you just said with the utopia piece. I was like, oh, okay, I do actually feel that I could contribute something particular on this very specific narrow bandwidth of this enigma. And Maybe you have this experience too, which I would be very, I want to ask you about this and get into a conversational sure. mode with it, which is I've found that the blessing, when you hit this fulcrum where you realize, okay, I can't do everything. I'm going to have to do something to do something deeply. But then you find that if you do anything deeply, it takes you to the same vista. It's like all of these beautiful, you drill one hole deeply anywhere in integral and you can still get to this vista where you find everyone else. It's like we come out on the other side of that membrane and go, oh, we're all here. Cool. <laughs> I did. For a while, I felt like I was going to be completely fucking alone because I'm digging this tiny specific thing. In my case, aliens and artists and how our de creative development is impacted by that. That seems so specific, then it always opens up. Typically, every conversation that I have with these artists opens up into this big universal us, the big mutuality. That was such a relief to me because then the concern of being isolated or insular dissolves. There's still a big we there. Have you had, I mean, if you are willing yeah, to share with me. That's my take as well. I mean, I... I suffer from a fear of missing out. <laughs> that sort of, you know, if I'm really honest and self-attentive, it haunts everything I do, this fear of missing out. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, ever since I was a kid, I felt like obsession was the appropriate tool for education, mm. right? Because we're not, it, it's not really an industrial metaphor where you drill down like you're laying a pipeline or trying to get natural gas out of the ground. Organic drilling down is like a tree where it expands out as it goes deeper, right? And I oh, always, like, if a person yeah. gets obsessively, like not neurotically obsessive, but like just passionate about one thing, if you can really get into that, it naturally touches a ton of things. And then you move on to your next obsession and it touches a bunch of things. And yeah. that's almost like the organic mode of education. Yeah. Hmm. I love that. Just you bringing up a tree, if you don't mind a tangent. Yeah, I do have this particular, the, the tree as the metaphor has ironically been a concrete operational driver for me. And by that, I mean actual trees in physical reality. I go on dog walks all the time and there's, you pass all these trees and at some point, at some point a few years ago, I was standing in front of this tree and i had this 
micro quasi epiphany that if you could comprehend and completely take into your consciousness any tree, any singular tree that would be an immediate doorway to nature mysticism as delivery mechanism to just God contact, Godhead contact. And that notion, which was delivered to me by that originating tree, I have just continued to check in on that everywhere I've gone with trees. And it still feels to me like there's something there that any tree. And then I, I read this book, but I believe it was called the secret life of trees. And then there was this uh, also a tangent of the tangent. There's a series, I believe it's available on Amazon in Gaelic, which is wonderful, just about trees. And as a comedic aside, I mean, first of all, the series is wonderful just because it goes in to the species native and non-native in Ireland and Scotland, the Gaelic speaking portions of the world, where when you check on it, there's really only like 100 or 130,000 uh, fluent native Gaelic speakers left in the world. But this entire series about trees is in Gaelic. And there must be 30 or 40 arborists and specialists in a wide variety of domains with trees. And they're all speaking in fluent Gaelic. They found like 30 or 40 fluent speaking Gaelic arborists. And, <laughs> and they did the entire 10 part series or whatever it is in Gaelic. That alone became this peculiar creative work coupled with my already existing fascination with these trees and how they might as contemplative targets be mystical portals to God contact. And I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't normally go off on that tangent with most folks, well, but with it's, yourself. It's tangent. I relate to a lot of it. Uh, I like my first thought is that uh, Gaelic arborist is a code word for ruin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes um i was in love with trees when i was a kid i grew up like really rural in the pacific northwest just immersed in forests and trying to you know go as many trees across as i could without coming to the ground like it was a sport mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff and when i got in my last year in high school I was asked to participate to what they called the rugby talent show where everybody did performances. I didn't plan it at all until the very last minute. We did this extremely strange kind of Dada-ist performance that was so weird that when we came off stage, me and this little troop of people I'd taken on, we got the hell out of there. We were just like, didn't want to face the audience or the teachers at all. We'd, we'd done something so off the grid from their point of view. And we went up this hill in the park and I was so charged up that there was a tree up there at the top of the hill. I'd seen it many times. And this time it was rustling and crackling. And it was like, I could hear it in my mind. <laughs> it told me wow. to go to the South. Right. And a few months later I did, I, I ended up leaving university and moving to Belize for a while. And it was, I just always heard that tree's voice in my mind. And in a way it was the first time as an adult, a young adult that I really thought shamanism is something I absolutely have to focus on. <laughs> wow. Okay, so do you mind if we yes, explore go. some aspects of that? Yeah. So number one, initiation. Would you say that that was perhaps your first initiation experience into a deeper recess of what was going to burgeon into your spiritual, shamanic, and otherwise, you know, the big inside of your life? I, I would say that... Um... As a plausible adult, yes. Like I could find echoes of that and premonitory events in my childhood. Uh -huh. But as a, you know, someone who can legally vote and drive a car, yeah. uh, in that phase of my life, this was, was the first major event that stayed with me and sort of internally symbolized the fact that I had to really pay attention to this aspect of life, which was the interfusion of spirituality and ecology, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when the communication transpired, what was the feeling in your body and what was the modality of that message? Was it verbal? Was it somatic? It was, um, it was like a 
clean verbal, like it was stripped down, like it had no tone to it at all. It wasn't anybody's voice. Mm. It wasn't that kind of acoustic verbal, but it was as if there were words, but the kind of words that slip right between your brain hemispheres, so you can't grab them. Yeah. Uh, I was already in a kind of peak state. I was really energetically charged up because we'd done this very unusual and expressive performance. Uh, and I just knew that I was somehow in the wilderness now, you know, conceptually, psychologically, existentially in the wilderness, not just in the actual wilderness, but oh, yeah. they converged. And um, it was interesting because I didn't, it's not like I believed or disbelieved the voice of this tree. Right. It just was there. And then, and, and in fact, it was years later that I was really able to make the story out of it and go, oh, right, that tree told me this. And then in fact, I, I obeyed that tree over the next mm. six months. I didn't every day think about it and do that on purpose, but I absolutely did what that tree suggested. And did, was the geographical target clear and specific or was it just go south and then you intuitively knew what that meant? How did that shake out? That's tough, like with a lot of these things, because in retrospect, you naturally color it with the flavor of what you did after the fact. But I can't avoid that. Because I can't avoid that, I would say that the, the feeling of where I ended up deciding to go was implicit in that message. Mm. Now, maybe, was, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I added it later. Like, I've had birth memory experiences that I got later in my life. So did I add those in? Yeah. Or were they there from the beginning? Or Do you mind me if continuing to follow this thread with another question regarding that aspect? I don't mind anywhere we want to go. Okay, cool. So what's your take on this specific element addressing this? Okay, yeah, later in life, looking back, we color our experiences. But then you bring someone like an Eric Wargo into the equation, and he goes into his deep dive with retro causality, time loops, and this idea that, you know, specifically when he's talking about remote viewing now and he's writing these articles and he's saying, listen, virtually, no, not virtually, I believe he's asserting 100% of the time when remote viewing is accurate and actionable, it is a misidentified event of precognition. And retrocausality is what is informing this you know, his premise being that time doesn't function in this sequential temporal fashion that we're appropriating it for in most of our experiences. So to bring that element into your experiences, when you intuitively appraise, yeah, I listened to the tree and I took its directions and I went on this life path and it turned out to be good and I, I was obeying for six months or a year, but when I look back, maybe I'm just coloring that and reframing it with the events of my life. Do you think that it's a reframe or do you think there might be an element of retro causality? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, and normally I try to make a really balanced overview of all the possibilities, but I can tell you what my instinct is. Uh, my instinct is that there is no future, like it doesn't currently exist as a thing that can affect us, but nonetheless, the shape of time involves a loop that looks like retro causality mm. and that all of the, all of the momentum of the complex patterns of the present moment, um, you can sort of run those momenta forward and know what's going to happen before it happens, even though the future hasn't really happened yet. And there's a point at which the present moment sort of converges like a torus and folds back on itself. Mm. I don't think you can get deeply into time without, like a back loop kind of phenomenon. Uh, so I would say that the patterns of the world, like computational patterns, if you run them long enough, you might see something that hasn't yet happened because the world might be running a similar computation pattern to the one the computer runs. So I think there's a pattern that is my pattern. And it's possible to run your own pattern and some of the patterns in the world forward um, as if they were really there, but I don't, as much as I like the word retrocognition, uh, and retrocausality, I don't think the future is real enough to influence the present, except in the sense that the present is shaped like a loop that folds back on itself. Mm. And that's my overall emotional impression of the phenomenon. I'm very skeptical of retrocausality, um, in, in the sense of, 
the future's already laid out and I glimpsed it, but I'm very yeah. enthusiastic about it in the sense that I can't describe my experience of time at any level without some kind of loop that looks like that. Mm. That's fascinating. Do you feel that sequence exists? Do you feel that a succession of events is an accurate way of describing how our experience of the temporal unfolds? I, if that's even the right word, unfolds. I mean, that's in the question itself is do things unfold in a sequential progressive fashion? Uh, I guess I would say almost, I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's right on the edge. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's probably, in terms of the physics of the next hundred years, I think it's probably going to look like something kind of digital and computational, where what we think of as time is more like an update rule for pixels. Uh, mm. But in that there's multiple simultaneous update rules that look something like, you know, the quantum many worlds situation, that there's yeah. different potential sequences being run, but they're not being run like this, as if you're moving through, not a time sequence moving through space, because that's too space-like. It's a yeah. time sequence that it keeps occurring in the same spot, like updating a computer screen. Right. Uh, I think there are update sequences, but I don't think they're sequences in the sense of an arrow or a river or a road. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. And so do you feel like we don't have the requisite capacities yet to completely penetrate that emergent set of properties? Is that one of the beauties that will arise in the next century and allow for us to have a completely adjusted and more nuanced experience of this temporal flux? Uh, yeah, I think if there's a convergence of powerful computational models of what time might be with the uh, ancient human capacity to get deeper in our relationship with time. If those can converge, then we're in a really good spot. Because I think in some ways, our ancestors might have been better at some elements of time than we are, right? right? Like an ancient farmer has to take the next season seriously in a way that you don't have to take seriously if you can just go to the grocery store and buy produce, yeah. right? And a guy who builds a pyramid to last a thousand years, for him, a thousand years is really visceral. And yeah. for us, it, it's hard to even think about the next season. So I it's think so there were true. ways of, of, sub, of like upper left development in terms of how real extended periods of time are. And if we can master some of those techniques and combine it with advanced computational models of time, then I think we're going to break through in a really new place that will reframe all of our mysteries. That's a beautiful way to conceive. And circumnavigate that i have been feeling more and more of everything as a spherical spherical flux that's increasing in every direction simultaneously <clears throat> sorry to use a temporal reference but the what you just described on the one hand with the updated incredibly more sophisticated mathematical scientific descriptions of what time may be but then on the other end of this or a side of this sphere increasing at the same time is a deepening of our oldest most visceral roots that question i think is going to end up being a perennial one are you familiar with the long now this organization that's yeah, great organization yeah have you explored much of their work and uh, I know a little bit of it through Stuart Brand. I know Neil Stevenson's involved. Uh, I have a sense of their attempt yeah. to build things that reaffirm uh, humanity's commitment and feeling of extended temporal periods. Yeah. I find all of this really fascinating, and particularly where it begins to bump up against many of the high strangest qualities in contact experiences. I've been taking a peek the last few weeks into some of the details of folks I've been talking to on the podcast about the, the temporal oddities in their experiences. For instance, a group of people being shut off while one person's timeline continues to advance while another group is in stasis 
and this person goes through, you've, you hear this commonly. I was taken and I went to this realm and among, this might have been more of a home type realm where the entities do more of their daily work in their own culture. This person is there for what feels and appears to them to be weeks or months doing all of this work. And then they're returned and deposited in this timeline. And then the other timelines are brought back online. And for the people that were in suspension, no time has passed. And then for the person who was the recipient, weeks or months transpired and they're left to try to resolve these tandem, but disjunct timelines in their life. And that, I wonder how you feel about that kind of particular detail in these contact experiences and how what you just described might inform us getting a better understanding on that kind of puzzle. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think one of the things that we probably should all have an intuition for is that going forward with time means going forward with a multiplicity of time, right? If we think about in the, in the integral sense of, what is time at different stages of development, right? Yeah. Seemingly little windows in the past, right? And then you get to the kind of uh, theocratic kingdoms and they all think, well, it's about 6,000 years. That's how long the world's existed. Yeah. And then you get to these people who think, no, it's about 14 billion. And then you get to <laughs> people, right? And the next people are like, yeah, it's about 14 billion, but it's happening a thousand different ways simultaneously. Right, and you get to like, what is quantum time? If we want to throw that word in without sounding too pretentious or vapid, right? Every version of quantum mechanics has some sense of multiple pathways in the same event. Mm. Right, and whether we think those are possibilities or probabilities or actualities, nonetheless, our best, most accurate method of describing the physical universe is one where we split a phenomenon into a whole bunch of versions that reconverge at a point. Uh, yeah. And we can't, we can't get more accurate using a single timeline. So I think our description of time is going to have to involve multiple, you know, whatever they call it, counterfactual. This is what happened, but this is what could have happened. Yeah. And if we treat what could have happened as real, we actually get a better prediction about what really happened. That's amazing. And I don't think there's any way to go forward without a kind of branching, like the roots of the tree or the branches of the tree. That's probably a good metaphor for what it is. Uh, and I, so I think there's multiple versions of each of us and also in the kind of the integral model, we'd have multiple parts, right? Like what might happen if somebody was with their friends going through upper right time and an event happened that knocked them into upper left time or something like that or oh. lower left time. And what they had was a deep cultural experience that was going at a different rate than the upper right time until it snapped back together. Something wow. like that. Have you written about this? Uh, not really. I talk about it a lot, though. Because <laughs> that's, as soon as you related that, it immediately felt consonant with all of the temporal pieces we've been discussing for the last few minutes. And yet, I've never seen that anywhere. I've never seen anyone unpack time as unfolded in that tree root fashion, which feels so satisfying and, you know, my somatic relationship to it and hearing that is just a sense of relief like yes of course that makes so much more sense uh senses in every regard I, it would be really cool if you felt inclined to write that paper <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean there's so like we were saying earlier there's so many things i could write yeah so some of them i write because it's so perfectly me and other times it's for someone or for something, right? Yeah. So I think, oh, Stuart asked for this, then I can write it, right? Because then God. I have to select out of all the things I could write. That just feels to me like if we imagine the invisible college becoming visible through exo studies in a master course, that feels like one of the classes that needs to be in place and unpacked. Everything you just related in that synopsis. I would love to feel that just pulled out like a xylophone over the course of a nine week study. So, you know, I'm not, I know that's a ridiculous thing to try to put on your shoulders. It's just a fantasy I have having heard it. 
Well, I like the sound of it myself. Uh, <laughs> we, I, I mean, I could take a few steps in that direction and we'll see what comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention was, um, I mean, when I was a boy, Terrence McKenna was a big influence. Mm. Terrence McKenna is a guy who brings ecology, time, and the alien other together yeah. in a really interesting fractal manner. Right. And it's not that I think he was necessarily correct in his prognostications of things. His yeah. overall map isn't that great. But the fact that he was concerned about those particular themes in conjunction yeah. feels really significant to me. Yeah, I totally agree. I, again and again, he is presented, invoked, respected by such a myriad number of people from so many disciplines who all have a passionate contact point with this nexus, let's just call it of not just the, the alien and the ecology, but this tight little engine driving so many of our development. He comes up again and again, and he's a cat who deserves a longstanding position in our hearts. I completely agree. Very much so. I have a similar feeling uh, in a different way for Alan Watts. You know, I, Curiously, when I was coming up through Integral, I was like bonkers having a major healing experience with Alan Watts. Just There were many times in my life where I would sink into a depression or have an onset of anxiety or get a developmental vertigo. And just listening to his voice for five or six hours a few times would organize my being. And I also found him curiously absent from the integral, you know, the vetted integral membership in some strange way. Like he didn't come up much that I heard of. Not that he was disrespected anyway. He just was kind of out of the loop. But then I started to, there's another thing I'd like to ask you about, which is the, I, I feel like this is slowly being corrected perhaps but the curious absence of the Western esoterica from the integral lexicon, so to speak. It feels like so sort of tipped toward the Eastern, tipped Eastern, but then also tipped like Western academic. And then in the middle, I find myself feeling like, what happened to the Hermetica? What happened to Rosicrucianism? What happened to all the Western esoteric traditions? And do you feel like that that was just too much of a liability or it wasn't, it wasn't cool at that time? What, or am I just misunderstanding it? Did it have a presence and I missed it? I think its presence is growing. Uh, I think that um, part of it's cultural and part of it's political. Uh, there's a political element in which when you're trying to get a philosophy started, and I'm sure, and I, I don't know if it's conscious or not on Ken's part, right? He was, he was influenced by Alan Watts' writing style. He sort of... Yeah of that but uh there's a sense in which you're trying to start a movement you want to make allies with big entities right yeah. you want to make sure there's an integral buddhism and an integral christianity and then reach out maybe there's an integral islam and integral hinduism and you go down yeah. the line and then you end up with okay now let's talk about integral shamanism integral yeah. magic integral alchemy that kind of stuff <laughs> That's the integral <laughs> the integral golden dawn is way down that spectrum it's way down the line <laughs> So I think it's partly that, like that's politics yeah. and that's reasonable. But the other part is culture, which is the whole Western world leaned to the East intellectually and spiritually since the 60s. Yeah, and It takes a few decades to look over there and see what's going on. And it's going to take a few decades to see that there was some stuff in the West. And then it's going to take a few decades to integrate that. Yeah, I think a lot of people who came up in uh, you know the 70s, 80s and 90s, are more comfortable with that stuff because they had reasonable, good humored people telling them about it. Like when I was a kid, mm. Robert Anton Wilson, huge influence in terms of, Hey, Gurdjieff, Hey, Alistair Crowley, Hey, alchemy, Hey, hermetic magic, ceremonial magic. It's all interesting psychoneurological brain change stuff. You might want to try out it. It's absolutely um, transrational, which is to say you're hearing it from a guy who sounds like he's at least rational. <laughs> <laughs> and I think people who came up in the 50s they didn't have guys like that telling them about it very much 
Yeah. Right? There was an explosion of later new age stuff and now internet stuff that puts this in front of you in ways that make sense. And you go, oh yeah, that's right. I, I guess. Now for me, I'm yeah. a, right? I had this grandmother, Ruth. She died when I was young and she left me her books that were on the upper shelf of our bookshelf. And her books were, uh, you know, Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages and just yeah. amazing, beautiful, alchemical, Rosicrucian and Hermetic documents that uh, they're still in the back of my mind, the images and the symbols of those things. So I've always been passionate about it. And it's always seemed pretty normal and straightforward to me. And I think a lot of people of my age bracket also have that sensibility and people a little bit older maybe don't have that. Yeah, that completely makes sense. And also just to underline and affirm the notion that putting together any kind of integral impetus <clears throat> and striving to make sure that it doesn't come apart at the seams and the rivets don't pop out. You know, if you open a little embassy in a wild territory, you can't immediately fling open all the doors and have it overrun with every possible permutation of a visitor. And I think that there was definitely decades. I mean, I'm guilty of this myself in a weird way because I went from coming up in a fundamentalist Christian home environment culture. Although by the time I was in my early teens, I had disidentified with that, but I was beholden to it until I got to leave home and go at the age of 20, discover Buddhism. And then of course, thinking there was some unique, uh, s s something particular and individual about me finding Buddhism and falling in love with it. Wow, how, how amazing and extraordinary. I've found this Eastern path and like, not understanding that this itself is a trope. This itself is like one of the oldest grooves in the archetypal set of impulses to just export everything that I had never dealt with in Christianity, superimpose it onto Zen, reenact the behavior of all my ancestors going back generations, just a perfect transposition of epigenetics into Zen, do that for 10 or 15 years, wake up one day, you know, metaphorically, uh, not in the spiritual sense, but in the trauma, confusion, shadow sense. Just a sec, I gotta fix my mic, it's misbehaving. Um, <clears throat> and then realizing that I had created a perfect facsimile of Christian fundamentalism and cloaked it in Zen. And then all, it took so long through all of that to come to a set of relationships and conditions where I realized, oh my God, Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, like what is going on over here? And then starting to look into that. And weirdly, you know, f for me, and again, I would like to hear your experiences with this. It felt to me like 15 or 20 years earlier, I had the cognitive recognition of all of these things like the great chain of being the perennial philosophy like a, a cognitive understanding like oh there's these deep fundamental truths that are common among all of these systems and paths and religions and that that bedrock is going to be the orienting potential for us to find our commonalities and it points toward this great omega point or whatever you want to think of it as and then i didn't really experience a living version of that. I didn't experience as a felt first person encounter until like 15 years later, after going through like, oh my God, I just really converted Christianity to Zen. And oh my God, I, I'm the fundamentalist. And oh my God, I'm really like actually coming from this super amber approach to all the things I'm touching. And then I'm like, I'm converting it and modulating it in a really convincing way to frame it in some second tier bullshit. But actually, until I'm a dad for 10 years, I'm not going to get punched enough, boxed in the ring enough to really lose, be, you know, just like jujitsu. Being a dad for me was like 10 years of jujitsu in some ways. Not because of anything to do with my kids, all to do with my undeveloped 
ability to serve, love, have my life be about other people, just like simple, simple stuff about the personality, which is a long way to frame this up to say like, yeah, as soon as I read Integral immediately, I was like, whoa, big frontal structure recognition. But then like 10 or 15 years of a delay before my heart and my soul began to come online and have some communion with, you know, to really bring it full circle, like finding my love for Pierre Desjardins and the Christian mysticism that was in my roots, in my Christian fundamentalist family, like so close to home. And I had to go all the way around the world, like that itself being this old, you know, biblical tale in itself, cross-cultural tale. Did you tell me about your life well, in those I, regards? I, I connect to several aspects of what you were saying. Uh, first thing I think is it's beautiful to realize that you are, say, pursuing Eastern mysticism with a quasi-Christian dogmaticism. Right? <laughs> but then you, you end up realizing there's a difference in terms of levels or in terms of profundity between the content and the style. And it's not about the content of the level. It's about the style with which you go through that content. Those are the real levels. Yeah. That's the really important thing yeah. for people to see. I think absolutely we, we turn on parts of ourselves much earlier than we think, right? Just like there was, I mean, arguably modernity was present in ancient Athens for a yep. while, right? But it didn't stick. It took yep. printing presses and lenses and microscopes. It had to lock in doesn't mean it wasn't there trying to flicker to life much earlier. Yeah. And I ran into stuff like that. I mean, even Ken Wilber, I read him when I was 14 and thought, this was my thought. Yeah, obviously. And then I put the book aside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it, took, it was 15 more years before I was like, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but I think a large part of that um, is – how we learn and which parts of us learn, because it seems to me there's a real difference between conscious in the narrow sense of the conscious personality and who we really are as a deeper subconscious multidimensional human that maybe we have more access to when we're young. And then we sort of shift into this uh, socially curated frontal personality. Mm. which is important and has its uses, but it's not really the one who's doing the developing. Yeah. And the one who's doing the developing has its own tempo. It has to take things in. And the front part of the brain can go, absolutely, I get it. And the other part doesn't know. But sometimes the other part knows and the front part doesn't know. And this yeah. is something that uh, artists are more tuned into than most philosophers and scientists, which is, yes. you know, the surrealism of it, the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious as an overall relationship of intelligence. I so concord with that. And this image that's been with me for a long time pops up. It's that my frontal structure, my personality, we're going somewhere. We're in a car. Of course, the personality's got the wheel and it's driving. And then in the back seat, there's this really calm cat and he's just doing nothing. He's just sitting back there riding. And at some point in the journey, they stop and get out and it becomes apparent like the frontal structure gets out to peer, whatever, and it gets a glimpse into the back seat and it sees that that passenger in the back has all the levers to control the vehicle at his feet and has been steering this entire time and that the steering wheel's not fucking connected to anything. <laughs> and yet it's important. It's not merely a, it's not merely an aside or a comical gesture that the personality is at the wheel. That's important in some ways that we can't begin to appreciate until later in life. But I really agree with that notion you just shared, which is the parts of us that learn and the ways in which they learn being this much more interesting Rubik's cube kind of activity rather than to get back to the temporal discussion, a sequence. You know, this notion that we have a sequence, well, maybe, sure, maybe we have 95 modalities of temporal sequence. However many modes of learning and intelligence and varieties of the locus of consciousness, which I think I've always, not always, but the last 10 or so years, I've had much more of an enjoyment regarding the self as a choir. Because I'm a musician, because 
it's music because it's art for me and dealing with aspects of self and trying to create a symphony instead of a cacophony and three, two, one and big mind dialogue and voice dialogue, you know, those bits of those heritages brought forth into integral. I found this benefit from considering each of these voices and types of intelligence and modes of learning to be a voice in the choir. And they're each crucial that you never would look and say, I would prefer to have less options creatively. I would prefer a diminishment of my resource. Like you know, no one would do that. So all those voices are amazing and beautiful and powerful. And to bring into the fold again, uh, the ways in which we learn and the parts of us that learn when they learn and this, seeded or let's call it a kind of enchanted time capsule manner in which some formative events in our life, as you related, like I read Ken Wilber at 14 and went, of course, and I shut the book. And then all these years later, oh, that seems to me to be a feature that we could investigate in many different aspects. And one of them which is a real strong one, is in the contact world. This is something we hear all the time from contactees, artists included, and aliens and artists. And that is that whatever these non-human intelligences are, they seem to have a great understanding and facility with a vastly expanded sense of anticipation. And I don't know if we want to call it precognition or we can't really understand it as part of the point. They experience with manipulate and shape time apparently in a way that we don't yet understand and so to get specific about it you'll find all the time that there's an important initial we might call it an initiation even period of a kid's life in which contact begins there's teachings the teachings have all sorts of transrational qualities to them. The kid doesn't understand. 90% of it is below water. And yet the entity transmitting these formative experiences seems to have a real nuanced grasp of how this is going to be important in 40 or 50 years, sometimes even like a century out. And so the person goes through their life and then they have this version of what you and I are relating, which is like, holy shit, a, eu a eureka moment. 40, 45 years, all of a sudden, a flood of memories come online. Their seeming significance, the import, what it is all about. It seems to be a developmental driver like that kicks in later in life like a fucking booster rocket suddenly. So what I'm asking you about specifically is that time capsule phenomenon as it relates to contact and high strangeness. Have you had any of that? What's your notion of it? as it sits in these puzzles? Well, uh, you know, my own experiences sort of have been with me throughout my life. So it's hard not to think about them as having been kind of built in from the beginning and also having a kind of time release effect. Um, now, whether or not that's, you know, a probabilistic future knowledge pre-presencing itself, whether it's just the fact that I have my particular style and whatever is going to come is going to come to me in my style. So if whenever I have an authentic moment of anticipating what something could be like, I'm anticipating it in the flavor in which I might end up experiencing it. If I experience it, I experience it in that flavor. And I've known that flavor all along because that's my specific existential signature. Yeah. Um, but there's a ton of interesting things in what you said. I mean, I think about a higher development in a way as good timing, mm. right? You don't have to have pre-knowledge of the future in order to work well with time as it unfolds. Mm. And even in the degree to which it might seem profound and anticipatory, there's a great, one of the Harry Potter movies has this thing where the, the girl gets a little thing that lets her go back in time so she can do multiple courses then all the kids go back in time and they're in the past and the wizard has given her this and they're trying to solve a problem in the past and Dumbledore is there and he's distracting people from what they're doing in the past. Now he doesn't know that they're there, but his level of development, so to speak, is so great that he's got perfect timing. He's working well with everything that's happening, even though he doesn't know what's happening. 
He's actually wow. solving more problems than he's aware of just because he relates to the unfoldment so well. And I think a lot of really impressive historical individuals have been like that. It might seem like they have knowledge of the future, but what they really have is amazing ability to surf with the present to the point that it blows our predictive capacity out. Yeah. That brings to mind for me, as you were just sharing that, what I saw is an orchestral musician, the violist, second violist, sitting with 118 other musicians. Now ask yourself as that violist, what does it mean to have good timing? What does it mean to have good time? It superficially means this piece that we're playing, which is at an 82 tempo, should be played at, at an 82 tempo. That's the not even ideal form, let's just call that the fundamentalist form or the conventional form or whatever it is that good timing would concord with the prescribed preferences of the composer and the piece as written. None of that jives with reality. As soon as you take any integral glimpse, the interior state of all 118 musicians that day, the room that they're in, the temperature, the social conditions which are fluxing around the building they're performing the piece in, it infinitely unfolds into this mirrors facing mirrors multiplication. And so then in that integral sense of what does it mean to have good time here? If the intelligence of that violist in that set of conditions, if their sensitivities and talents can remain permeable enough and sensitive enough to register all of that and include it and respect it without forfeiting their agency, then somewhere in the negotiation of all of that becomes this good timing that you were just relating with the Harry Potter metaphor. Like that's what I feel that kind of performance and musicianship and artistry can countenance when the set of preparation is there you have to have done your homework you have to have, obviously we know that the cultivation just of playing the viola itself <laughs> is the excruciating amazing path and let that alone and then all of the 118 they've done that like the preparation and then when that moment arrives that good timing and then as listeners you and i i know we could just make a big list of these artistic experiences we've had that our encounters with an orchestra when the timing is right and those sensitivities and preparations are brought online with this perfect magic flux and the rightness of it and how you couldn't engineer it and you can't command it, but when it arrives, it just changes everything and then you never forget it. One of those is enough to send you off on a different life path, right? Yeah. Let me ask you what your first memory of that experience is. That's really interesting because the, I mean, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I, I have a memory of being born, but I got that memory Ooh. in my mid 20s. <laughs> 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 right? So, like, arguably that's the first one, but maybe it's not. Maybe I had it, maybe I spliced it in when I received it, or maybe it was there all along, but it had a certain. You know, there was this sense, my mother always told this story that when she uh, felt like I'd been conceived, she went out on the beach and it was the biggest storm that had hit our island and she had already had decided the name and shouted it into the storm. Anyway, I had this experience in Japan in my 20s, very vivid, indistinguishable from my other memories at that point, of the night of a big earthquake, actually. And it was me coming down through a storm like vortex, <laughs> hearing that call and like entering, entering in a way where I didn't know what was what. Like I couldn't tell my mother from my father, from the room, from the other people who were there. It was all just swirling and swirling. And, you know, and I couldn't, whether it was, it were structures in my fetal brain or they were perceptual structures in the room. There was a long period of, I can't tell the difference between anything, but it slowly spiraled down into just being me at essentially the moment the cord gets cut. 
right? And that was, Shit. although there was, you know, there's sequence and there's circling, the overall orchestration of all the factors was amazing. Like you couldn't, I couldn't perceive any element of the phenomenon without hearing 30 other elements also playing their instrument properly in that moment. Right? So it's a, a real sense of overwhelm. And I wonder how many potential memories we have that we don't add into our linear time track merely because we can't really process how many factors are coordinated in that moment. Oh my God. Go something toward the contact experience, missing time and freezing and things like that. Yes. Okay. So like three questions just pop up. I want to get to the third one being memory, available memory. You were asking how many memories might be available to us or extent we're not contacting and why. I want to ask about hypnosis and as it pertains specifically to recall traumatic events, experience or contact events that bifurcation point between, hey, let's use this as a forensic device versus, hey, healing the trauma and giving someone a way forward to live in a healthy, integrated way, not paying attention so much to the veracity of the historical details. So that's the question I want to get to. But first, so if I understand this correctly, you were in your 20s in Japan and an earthquake hit yes. and that attended the recall of this memory, which the quality of which once it arrived was the same as any other memory that you have now, like eating Rice Krispies a week ago. Yes. And that memory that arrived and came online was you coming down with what, like a 360 degree radius of perception into this? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, omnidirectional and spiraling and, um a lot of different media modalities overlaid on each other, right? It was like seeing the texture of the trees on the island where I was born and a map of the island and also my emotions about my parents. And there was kind of a superfused matrix that I had to go through <laughs> first. <laughs> Holy shit. What is the degree to which recall is as vivid and precise now of that memory as it was when it came online in your 20s? If it's possible to make such... Yeah. Um, it, it's very hard to say because um, having articulated it to myself and others a few times, I've reinforced some elements and uh, possibly skewed some elements merely by virtue of the fact that I've articulated it. So like with all of our memories, they're cultivated by in a preferential way. The ones yeah. you like when you wake up from a dream, if you tell yourself the dream, Later, you can tell someone the dream and you remember those parts, but you know you left some out that you didn't yeah. tell yourself, even yeah. though you experienced them. So I think yeah. what I've got now is a vivid recall of the parts that I practiced remembering. That is such an astounding story. And have you and your mother spoken about it? Has that yeah, we've part of a conversation? We've, we've got a very... Uh, <laughs> Open discourse, let's say. <laughs> What's your mother's, if you don't mind, if it's too personal, cool, or whatever, but, you know, having inherited that set of books from your grandma and having this recall of your very inception, what is the familial degree of having roots in these kinds of experience, these kinds of traditions? Are you an anomaly or is this a lineage that you feel is in your bloodline? Uh, this is definitely lineage-like. Um, my mother has a lot of these sorts of experiences and was very open about them, um, which was useful to me as a boy. Uh, her mother and uh, uh, maybe the grandfather as well is as far back as I can trace it. Uh, on my father's side, I'm not sure. He seems to bring the more of the you know, Taoist, uh, rationalist element <laughs> into the mix. Uh, but definitely on the, that side, the Robinsons, there's a, a plausible shamanic lineage. <laughs> because I, you so know, Graham Hancock speculates about this kind of thing, that there's, everybody has access to some of these experiences, but some people are genetically predisposed to have a much greater range of these same experiences. And they yes. were traditionally, you know, the potential shaman class. All right, before we get to hypnosis, memories, and contactees question, that bringing up Hancock and the genetic predisposition, 
which I find to be such a fascinating point of inquiry. Are you familiar with this? Just recently, Richard Dolan did a day-long presentation, which I believe he called something to the effect of a debriefing for, as though he were creating a brief for the highest levels of the U.S. government. He did about a seven or eight hour comprehensive front to back. Here's what's going on after 25 years of research. Here's the best of the knowledge that I can provide with a high degree of confidence. And then here's what I think it means ultimately. Did you, are you, did you see any of that? Or are you aware of it? I saw that it happened, but I didn't get to see any of it actually. Okay. Which is not necessary for the question I'm going to ask. But within that presentation, he brought up this, this factor of what he, well, not just him, it is called the D allele gene. And I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a biologist, cripes, I'm just an artist. And so my degree of uh, capacity in the biological sciences is nil. That's my caveat. What I'm about to relate and share with you and ask you about is what I got through a Richard Dolan presentation. And he got it through an authority who had devoted a great deal of her career. He was very tight with her. So this was not tangential for him in any way. They'd known each other and worked together for, I believe, 10 or 15 years. And they both lived in Rochester. So this was not a casual professional tie. And through her books and her work, one of the main points of focus for her was the D allele gene, which arose to the best of our knowledge, I believe at this point, between 40,000 and 60,000 years ago in a very specific part of Mongolia, present day Mongolia. And what that gene's arrival brought was an explosion, almost like a ma um, micro Cambrian explosion of human creativity. And so from the perspective of this narrative, the idea is that up until now, we have a generally long-standing, rudimentary kind of human creativity. Yes, there's a lot in the archaeological record that shows us about tools and all. That's all still valid and acknowledged. But around 40,000 years ago, when this D allele gene appears, we get this profusion of an utterly a quantum jump, pardon the phrase, suddenly the appearance of the most incredible, sophisticated, highly developed cave paintings. These depictions throughout France and Spain and that region, uh, which, by the way, also include UFOs. And I dive into that on a recent episode of Aliens and Artists, and we could make a note for people if they want to. There's a paper by Amy Michelle that specifically goes into real great detail on what these cave paintings meant and why the UFOs and them and the entities are important combined with all of the other animals. But back to the point of... The arrival of the D allele gene augured this explosion in human creativity and much of it began to filter through artistic expression and this entire new modality. Art itself in much of the way that we relate to it now was born. And then from my bias, you know, the way that I look at that is that from those artistic explosions and creative explosions, we got the linguistic proliferation and we began to get societal organizations and every, all the aspects of religion, civilization, all the great stuff of humanity, in my opinion, to and arguably to a degree was benefactor. We are the benefactors of that DLE arrival. So what's funny about this in the weird way is that when they initially found the DLE, there was a placeholder for a long time that said, this is probably, we don't know where this came from, it came out of nowhere but it's probably from Neanderthals or it's probably from some other hominid species that humans had sex with and we just don't know who they are yet, but we'll find them. Well, fast forward 30 years, apparently no. To this day, no one has any clue. They've done the checking to the degree that's possible and all of the candidates that would have been ex exp explanations for how we obtained this gene have been ruled out and it remains this big mystery. Now, the woman who told all this to Richard Dolan, her hypothesis, is that the correct use of this word, was aliens, that we were genetically modified, and that there was an intentional insertion from a foreign 
intelligence to create the acceleration of our timelines and our developmental conveyor. So <laughs> looking at your epigenetics and looking at Graham Hancock and his idea, I apologize. Okay. There's a dump truck. These motherfuckers cleaning up the trash in my neighborhood, beautifying my environment. How dare they? Get out of here! <laughs> so, you know, your story and Graham Hancock's idea that there is this genetic component, component which allows for certain individuals to be much more of a wide open receptor. And then this woman's work and Richard Dolan's at least tacit inclusion of it and one of the possible explanations for what has happened to us, particularly if there were to be a truth behind the idea that the, many of these visitors are not visitors, they precede us. This idea, one explanation would be like, these are the natives, we're the emergent and they're, they've been tinkering with us. So the nature of the relationship involves that stuff. I wanna just hand that lengthy preface to you for you to riff on that set of ideas, that woman's to Graham Hancock's to your personal epigenetic history. Well, there's obviously physical correlates to these phenomena of some kind. I would be astonished if there were not genetic predispositions the way there are for most things. Um, you know, whether or not aliens enter into the historical timeline and uh, mix with our DNA, uh, that's an extraordinary claim and it would require extraordinary substantiation. Uh, is it possible that not all the DNA on this planet is the same? that some of it's been coming from different sources all along. Maybe that would require extraordinary substantiation. Could we have spontaneously mutated in that fashion? That's plausible, right? Is it something like a McKenna scenario where our ancestors at that moment started to gobble or re-gobble massive amounts of some molecule like psilocybin and that created those explosions? But if that's the case, um, did that work best with people who had a certain genetic profile, right? And they were able to assimilate it better and pass the results on to their offspring. Uh, I think all of these things are possible. Some of them are more probable than others. Uh, some would require enormous proof. Uh, I absolutely think we have to look for physiological and physical correlates that support these phenomenon and the differences between people in terms of how they experience this. But I don't see yet the overwhelming evidence I would need to feel like there's some strong scientific substantiation of any of these scenarios. Yeah, exactly. You know, I want to get your take on this as well. You know, for me personally, and I bracket everything, because I do experience the manner in which our inquiry into these realms, each time some satisfying delivery of a insight, little eureka moment arrives, we get a new glimpse and apprehension of a portion of the puzzle that previously has been inscrutable. And then immediately it propagates into this multiplying of the puzzle we were solving previously. It's as though no satisfying answer or development even occurs without an increase of the puzzle that's unsolved now on your horizon. So yeah, you took a step. Oh my God, now there's this whole other new vista. That seems to be the exchange rate of getting involved in this stuff, at least for me personally. So, you know, that's a frame up to say like the only satisfying way that I find living this riddle is to make peace with, you know, create an accord with understanding that that's how the universe or these set of phenomena like to operate. That's their ecosystem. And if I'm going to swim in those waters, I better just be cool with knowing that for every one bit of satisfying response I get, there's two bits coming or 20 that are going to increase my unknowing. Uh, so just make it friends with unknowing. But specifically pertaining to the Graham Hancock 
domain of things. Let's just use him as an emblematic figure for questions like ancient aliens and some of which I feel like are rock solid enigmas like Gobekli Tepe. Clearly we're not imagining it. That fucking thing exists. Now we're asking ourselves who the, because you don't just make something out of nowhere 13,000 or 14,000 years ago. Something had to lead up to that and precede it to allow that level of sophistication and creating those structures, clearly that took some time to ramp up to as well. So what was that ramping up to? Those things feel to me like pretty stable points of contact to put our hands on as questions, not as things that we understand or know about. And then you get into more dicey territory. Like I don't watch ancient aliens. It's not my, doesn't satisfy my palate, you know, but I know of its existence and its popularity. And I know that this idea that the visitors, at least some of them have always been here, is popular. And I don't know what's going on, but I don't personally find that to be a real satisfying explanation for at least the conflagration of questions that I've been tackling for the last 25 years. And what I particularly find dissatisfying in it, in it is the way that it's seductive for us to disown our role and agency and what it's taken to exist and what we have created. And yes, we're fucked up and we're on a real precipice and have been for maybe at all times, but also I don't like someone trying to take our pyramids away. I don't like someone trying to tell me that because some entity has exotic technology, that that's an indicator. It's more spiritually evolved than we are. That's fucking bullshit. I feel more, of an advocacy around human sovereignty and around us claiming and owning our true depth and potential and our heritage as really amazing, creative, explosively unpredictable intelligences. And that if you take a few moments, I, this is a question, I, wanna, I want your take on all of this. When I have paused to take more of a view of it, I'm like, well, what I think actually is clearly evident in the mix of all of this is that these motherfuckers really want and need us. They are chasing us. They are so desirous, at least some of them, about something that is intrinsic to us, that they're restructuring a whole organizational existence. Imagine what it takes to con conduct and complete a protocol like abduction and hybridization. Imagine what it takes to operate in the shadows for a century in order to extract the materials, resources, interactions, implement your manipulations. That's a whole, that is their culture, arguably, to a great degree. And we're like going on about our business in a, in a way. And our business is crazy and it's a fucking chaotic set of situation conditions. But if you look at it from some angles, it looks like actually they're the ones who really need us and they're desperate for something. And much of this dynamic is about that, at least with some of them. And I, that is just my point is like, that's kind of the upside down version of what we hear all the time, often from pluralistic and beyond, is this idea that, oh, the great space brothers are here to free us and save us from our own misguided remedial unevolved ways. We're so cretinous. They're so exalted. What's your feeling on all of that? Uh, I think there's definitely a problem around anthropological lack of self-esteem in many respects, right? And whether it's uh, they need us more than we need them or we actually could do all the things that we think we might have needed ancient aliens to do. Um, either of those scenarios are scenarios in which we really affirm the range of possibilities and the massive novelty and worthwhileness of the human condition. Like I think that a lot of, you know, just like there's a, there's a contact experience in the weirdness of a cultural moment, also with uh, UFO type phenomenon, but also with the great gurus and saints of the human lineage. There's something similar there, right? And that you can have something like an alien contact experience with another human being if they are sufficiently weirdly developed. And it's not hard to imagine that ancient 
esoteric proto-lineages or small groups were able to successfully develop really transformed human beings to the point where being with them was like being with something that wasn't even human anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe these are the guys who designed the Sphinx. Maybe these are the guys who invented language, things like that, right? That something alien could have gone on, but that alien thing might be mostly something about us, something of which we are capable, something mm -hmm. we gave rise to. So there's that. Um, you know, and I, I think in a way the golden dawn and the idea of the secret chiefs and the idea that you might be able to go a step beyond being a Buddha and become some kind of creature that's barely perceivable <laughs> or which <laughs> psychologically distorts anyone who interacts with them and they get nosebleeds and missing time and hallucinate, right? That you're just like maybe a Buddha is the maximum development you can get and still be accessible to other humans. And maybe there's steps beyond that where we just won't remember or we'll imagine it was some other kind of contact. I think there's a tremendous range of possibilities in us and has been for thousands or millions of years that we really don't take seriously and we should consider as part of our own worth and possibility as humans. Now, That's so beautifully put. Please continue. I think there's also, when we consider entities, whatever we consider them to be, almost always a sense in which there's a multiplicity of species, so to speak. Right? And some of them might need us for what we might think of as malevolent reasons. <laughs> some of them might need us for benevolent reasons. Some might be indifferent to us. And some might need us for reasons uh, that we can't even conceive because their motivation is actually alien. And they don't want to either help or exploit because those are very human kinds of reasons. So I think we see whether it's... Um, in the ancient terminology of elves and aliens and devils or the new terminology of UFOs, almost always uh, benevolent, malevolent, indifferent, and mischievous types of these phenomena. And some of them probably need us. Some of them seem to feed on us. Other of them seem to feed us. And some don't care about us at all. So that's where I would go with that. That's such a great assessment. And to put a little addendum on what I just shared preceding your response. I am more particularly speaking on the frame of abduction and hybridization and the more, this question remains in flux, but let's just call it the more predatory or exploitative or at least traumatic. Now I also grant latitude for in the words of many of these experiencers that I'm having long-term relationship with conversations that are going on for months and years with them, there is also a factor. This is pretty old. This goes all the way back to John Mack and his continually assertion, like asserting that, listen, if you listen to the accounts of the experiencers themselves, they will tell you that their development as a conscious person, their spiritual, psychological, emotional cultivation in the face of these traumatic experiences in ways we don't understand can completely transform the nature of the contact as their life goes on. So someone who has a lot of young life traumatic experiences, we have to also hold open to the fact that when they get into the 40s or 50s or 60s, Sometimes these relationships with non-human entities changes into something that's strictly about teaching and there's no more trauma and there's no more transgression. And we don't really understand why that's the case. But he was saying that in the 80s and I'm hearing it from people now in the 2020. These, you know, I've spoken to many people in their 50s and 60s who say, you know what, I haven't had a bad experience since I went through menopause. It really, that stopped all of the stuff I didn't like, and it completely now is 100% benevolent, positive teaching. And then you get into these other really wild cards, which are, <laughs> you know, I have a mantis bias, as you know. We all just get particular interests according to our experiences. It's a deficiency that I hope correct if I can stay alive long enough, but... Nonetheless, I continue to get a preponderance of mantis reports and mantis experiencers. And in one in particular, I, there's this interesting detail to her experiences in which, uh, like myself, she's only had contact with one particular mantis entity. 
And that mantis entity has been her overseer, her handler throughout her entire life. When she was young and going through the traumatic stuff, it was at the top of that holarchy and all other entities, whenever present, deferentially deferred to whatever its wishes and program was. Then when she went through menopause, the rest of her contact experiences with this mantis entity have not only been positive, they've included her being tested and put through a set of, uh, a kind of testing we don't even really understand because the, the uh, artifacts and devices that were employed to test her, we don't have analogous devices in our human culture. However, it took place in front of a theater of other types of entities. And the point of the exercise was clear to her. This mantis entity was using her as an example to prove to these other varieties of species that human beings were capable of hitting this developmental or evolutionary mark that redeemed them. And it was trying to point out this human, there are many of them like this, and this is why we should go to the trouble of trying to deal with them as individuals. Now, <laughs> You know, what's funny about that to me is then you have to start to, if that's true and that's the case and I don't have any reason to disbelieve this woman, know her well enough to believe that at least what she's reporting to me is a genuine, her understanding genuinely of her experiences. She's not a liar. Um, if that's the case, then we have to begin to get into these swampy areas of like, okay, so... Uh, this actually, for me, comports with what's been communicated to me through the mantis entity I had contact, which is like, uh, not all mantis entities are doing the same thing. We don't even all agree on the same ship. Like, what kind of idea do you have in your head that simply all mantis entities do is head up abduction programs and run hybridization? That's, That's racist, man. <laughs> Right? <laughs> so then we are encumbered with the complicating factor of, okay, now I got to start to parse the individuality of insectoid non-anthropomorphic entities, which I'm pretty sure I don't possess those chops. <laughs> How do you go about that kind of puzzle? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an endless road. If you wanted to go down the uh, parsing apart and validating all of them individually in terms of what their worth are, because it's going to keep branching and dividing, I think. Uh, the more but it's the tree roots you talked about. It's the tree roots. But I think the more uh, practical part is the, is the kind of ancient shamanic part where, you know, the shamans would sort of look for people who'd had interesting experiences and then test them to see if they could move beyond that in a reasonable fashion. Right, because let's say you're one of these people who's open to this experience for some reason. Might be genetic, might be something else. Uh, doesn't mean you can actually work with it well. So you want to go through some kinds of tests that are put to you by the human shaman or by the spirit, so to speak, and they're going to try to find out whether you can transform the more dangerous parts into more workable parts. Uh, you know, like in the old movie in Dune. Right, you, you drink the sandworm venom and you've got to turn it over in your body to become one of the Bene Gesserit witches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, so there's an alchemical transformation. Can you upgrade it, right? And if you are more traumatized and if you are more locked into a very narrow worldview, it's going to be harder for you. If you're more flexible, if you're healthier, more resilient, or you've got a really useful guide, then your odds of being able to upgrade this experience into something workable is better. If you're very yeah. lucky, you grew up always thinking this was kind of okay and never really being worried about it, right? That was yeah. my experience. I would sometimes go, well, am I, am I not afraid enough? Because I feel fine about this shit, <laughs> yeah. right? And that's, that's not a common experience necessarily. I just got lucky in that regard. How many or how much of your experience and your story have you shared as it pertains to these types of experiences? And are you open to sharing some now with us in this context that you maybe haven't shared often or before? Uh, I've probably shared all the ones I can remember in different spaces. I try to be comfortable with it. Um, not only a variety of different flavors of experience, but whole sets of multiple interpretations of each of those experiences. So it's always, sharing is always sharing a slice. So it's yeah. tricky. You know, one of the 
uh, I think probably I mentioned this on my UFO thing. I mean, one of the most, one of the things that stood out to me as a kid the most, uh, because I had some experiences I asked my mother to write down. I don't remember them, but she wrote them down. So I have those, but I have them sort of secondhand from myself. But when I was a kid in the Bahamas, there was, there was a night in Nassau and we were staying at this guest house and all the adults were together having a dinner party and myself and the son of the guy who owned the guest house. We were out, we were climbing around the outside of the building and playing war. And we sort of came up with this story that we were going to fight aliens, not just do a human war. We went up to the top of this tower and we were pretending to shoot at spaceships. And a few minutes later, there was this thing in the sky, right? Huge lights moving like disturbingly slowly in the wrong direction. Like not, <laughs> was not moving as a thing should move. And it was receding toward a point that you shouldn't recede to. Anyway, it was there. We both exchanged and described it to each other. So there was interpersonal confirmation. We ran downstairs, but the adults were drunk and socializing and didn't really care about our story. But we saw it. We confirmed it for each other. Nonetheless, it showed up exactly as we had been pretending it was going to show up. So that it overwhelmed my sense of the boundary between the subjective, the intersubjective, and the objective, right? Because we saw it, I saw it, and there it was, and yet we'd made it up, and there it was, so what's inside and what's outside and what's made up and what's not made up. So that was one of the first times where I was old enough to say, this is really fucking with my basic categories. And maybe that's what this kind of stuff is. It's something outside of my normal ontological boundaries. Good God. Is that the first of your experiences or the first biggie? That's the first biggie where I was old enough that it's in my conscious memory track and where it looked alien. Right? Like, I'm like so alien. insane. Something that looked like an angel or something that looked like an elf, I might, you know, speak about differently. This, this one looked like a technological craft, but it had this same characteristic of hyper vividness and hyper peculiarity. Right, it was plausible enough that it was there, but not so plausible you couldn't wonder if you'd really experienced it. Oh and my god! It was god. doing something that didn't fit with my map of the perspectives of what reality does. It was like that—that that notion of receding in the wrong direction. Many of my experiences have had that quality at some point. Can I ask if you would share a few more? Maybe well, just some high water marks that you, whatever you prefer. Well, I'll, I'll tell you some of my favorites. Uh, when I was in high school, we lived across from these woods and there was a little glade out in the woods and I would go out and walk through the glade many times. And one time there was like, there was just an elf, right? And he looked so stereotypical. He was a few feet tall and he had on a kind of Santa Claus costume, like a classic European gnome figure. And the costume was blue and white. And he was running across the forest floor and I, this, I was, I froze. I didn't move. I don't know how long this took place. And in my mind, I said to myself, that's weird. He's wearing the wrong colors. Shouldn't he be wearing green and brown before the forest? And it was like, it took me a long time to think this out. And then I thought, what the fuck am I doing? Like, who cares what he's wearing? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I started to chase him and he jumped over some bushes and was gone. And I'll tell you, I mean, I went out to that spot many times afterwards to probe around where I'd last seen him. But the sense was, like, even at that moment, I thought, did I really see an elf? Or did some kind of energy pass through me that my brain only interpreted as an elf, right? It was just grasping around for material mm -hmm. because that I was already thinking about normal perception as something uh, neurally hallucinated, where my brain grasps around for material to make sense of incoming electromagnetic flux. But it had a feeling of, I want to say like Teflon, right? Like, like I have these means of processing reality. I can say different things about the world. It's inside, it's outside, it's singular, it's plural. This thing was so slippery, so frictionless, it missed all of my categories, right? It came in at the uh. wrong angle and it went out at the wrong angle. Wow. Holy shit. You know, just when you go back to a felt, simple body, listening with your body back, 
to that event yeah. has the status and interpretation changed since that time does it feel different to you now with every available sensory organ in your vast being did some new insight come online since then or it still is enigmatic it, it's still enigmatic and i think being enigmatic might be part of its nature at least relative to us um i think the flavor now in memory is the same as the flavor at the time but the range of the interpretations that i would apply is different like for example at the time i was very open to the notions of higher dimensions hyperspace i figured that's you know like jock fillet which i probably read years earlier at the time because of close encounters of the third kind yeah right? that this is a some kind of hyperdimensional phenomenon manifesting as ancient archetypes or contemporary ufo experiences or elves or aliens or whatever yeah. and it's coming from an outside of my reality and because it comes from outside of reality it crosses my basic reality binaries and it's always going to feel like a question mark and an exclamation mark combined yeah. So I thought that flavor, <laughs> that sense that like with UFO stuff, you find enough evidence to think, yeah, it definitely happened, but never enough to like conclusively prove it happened. There's yeah. always this wiggle of room. And I thought maybe that wiggle room is part and parcel of the experience because it's coming in from outside my reality bubble. So for years, that was one of my basic takes. And now philosophically, I think I'm not, able to imagine a space outside of my reality bubble mm -hmm. right I, it's not philosophically possible for me to think of everything and then think about something outside of everything yeah and I, i'm bullshitting myself when i do that i have to think of all of it as being on the inside of the same system yeah uh, i don't get the opportunity to imagine all of it and then something else <laughs> So I have removed <laughs> some of my interpretive options in an attempt to be more rationally rigorous about it over time. And I also have developed a few alternate possibility interpretations, yeah. uh, which intrigue me, but I, you know, they're not. What are they? Can you share a bit about those? Well, I, I, I like this thing I call the uh, pranic nano swarm. So here's how it goes. Um, normal, Electricity in the sky does weird things, right? Sheets, bolts can turn into a ball and attack sailors' vessels, has luminous properties. It manifests temporarily in the sky and it affects human beings and objects. That's normal electricity. So if we take the one assumption that the ancients made, which is there's an additional lifelike energy associated with air, right, that we might call prana, this phenomenon would be an atmospheric subtle energy. And why would it not do the same kinds of odd things that regular electricity does in the atmosphere, which is periodically concentrate in certain ways that produce effects on humans, objects, that produce luminosity, that disturb us at a cellular level, right? And these things could know things about us. If oxygen with pranic correlates constantly moves in and out of all brains, it could pick up patterns from those brains. So you've got this sort of um, etheric atmospheric electricity capable of imprinting to some degree on the patterns of biological phenomenon that it moves through, including us. So it's got the information patterns and sometimes it swarms and the swarm behavior exhibits properties not normally exhibited by the general uh, profusion of these pranic motes in the atmosphere. The swarm behavior might output luminosity, might output um, perceptual phenomenon to human beings that resemble things that humans have perceived before, it might output noises, it might output disturbances to neurological systems, right? It might uh, scramble the electric fields you're using to perceive or remember phenomenon or to operate your body. So this is a, and that different people would perceive it in different ways. And that if it happened at different electrical frequencies, it might have different moods. Some of those being malevolent, some being benevolent, so to speak. Because what we don't know is what the real range of the phenomenon are. Many people today uh, explicitly feel like, or have been told by entities that these are interstellar, intergalactic, whatever. But if we look at the actual phenomenology, 
we don't see people having these experiences yet anyway, outside of the general envelope of the planet Earth. So it could easily be an effect of the subtle energy field of the biosphere. Because 99.9% .9 of all the encounters have occurred within the biological atmosphere of this planet, as far as we can tell, right? If somebody yeah. went into deep space and a robot had the experience, that would invalidate my theory. But what I like about it is you can kind of work from one assumption that maybe prana is real. And if you follow it down and go, hey, like every other energy, it's quantized. Like every other phenomenon, it could swarm. The swarm might have emergent effects. So you could, you could hypothetically say it's all described by one assumption. Wow. Uh, I like that. And what I mostly like about it is it challenges the normal interpretations because angels, ghosts, future travelers, hallucination, lies, hoaxes, those are all too clumsy for me. N none of them are quite right. And I want people to reach for more interesting options. I want them to try to describe more with less in whatever creative way that they can. That's pretty amazing. First of all, I've never heard that before. I've never heard of that idea. It actually is also not exclusive with any of those other, it could be that ghosts are real and that's sure. not a issue with what you just described. What also came to mind immediately was missing 411. Do you feel like that pranic swarming could have volition and intention an objective it wanted to achieve, could it possibly comport with missing 411? Yeah, so here's what I would say is um, the qualities that we associate with living things would be sort of uh, microscopically distributed among the motes of livingness energy, right? If we took that hypothesis to be correct. If you had a swarm of livingnesses, then they would exert more qualities associated with more complex forms of life so that they could have quasi-sentience, quasi-intentionality, things like that, which they seem to do because people encounter these phenomenon and yet there's an ambiguity about it, right? You see something, you have a one-to-one -one experience, you encounter an intelligence, you encounter an agency, absolutely. But at the same time, the edges are fuzzy. Right. So I would say quasi agency, quasi intelligence, because I just don't want to limit it. Now, maybe it absolutely is a concrete fundamental intelligence of some kind. Maybe it isn't, but there's a gradient there. And so this the pranic nanoswarm hypothesis would allow them to move along the gradient depending on how intense the swarm was. The more dense the swarm, the more they would exhibit qualities associated with living organisms. There's another element of what you just related that is really fascinating to contemplate in the context of missing 411 and that's all the weather events so a pranic swarm and again i'm not a climatologist but tell me how this feels a pranic swarm could actually potentially account for the bizarre high strangeness of these consistent weather events that show up on the front and the back of the kid or person going missing. So we're dealing with these profile points. For listeners who are not familiar, I'm sure most people are. I apologize, there's a skateboard outside my house. I will, I will send my Doberman into the street shortly. It will be resolved, um, or not. The profile points for anyone who's not familiar with Missing 411, just Google David Pilatus, Missing 411. You, you can watch a few hours or 10 hours or whatever of uh, interviews and whatever, you'll get a great sense of it. So I'm not gonna go into a definition and description of what this full phenomena is, because actually I think probably most listeners are acquainted with it. But we, we're not just dealing with this, the high strangeness of how does a five-year-old boy traverse 13 miles of wilderness in a 30-hour period across the roughest terrain? Um, why are there clothes found? years later, neatly folded, 13,000 feet in elevation, but they haven't aged at all. There's just a shitload of these weird profile points that plant these events clearly in a different category or zone than a normal missing person case. And David Pilatus goes to great lengths to make those discriminations. One of them is every, well, not every time, but very often when search and rescue <laughs> begins their search, 
Dogs can pick up no scent. It's one of the big profile points. There's no scent. That is utterly anomalous. And these are the best dogs in the Western world. And if you do a little bit of looking into dogs' sense of smell, which I've done just because I love my dog, and it's a whole fascinating reality. Talk about ontology. Dogs are living in a different – they're – listening to and reading stories that we just don't even know exist all the time. But so dogs can't pick up a smell and then the weather event. And in terms of a pranic swarm, if the pranic field were real, certainly if it's capable of interacting with objects, human beings, consciousness, oxygenating patterns of our biology, certainly it is reasonable to think it could interact with the weather. And before it's specified condensed swarm state, it's conceivable it could shift that microclimate to create these storms, which again and again and again disrupt the search and rescue efforts of these teams. It happens over and over. How does that feel to you intuitively as an idea? Well, the connection to the weather feels very connected to what I'm saying. I think of two things. One is when I lived in Belize, there was a, we lived out on the islands for a while. And one night there was a huge hurricane and i was excited we went out on the dock and we lay there and sort of got to look up into the vault of the storm and it felt absolutely like every contact experience i've had and so that after that night i thought why on earth would a weather pattern feel the same to me as contact experiences that's peculiar and then later i read uh mckenna's story about being in the amazon Right. And while they were trying to do their very interesting psychedelic resonant effects on his brain's neural DNA, um, they went out and they saw clouds and they watched the clouds for a long time. And the clouds eventually formed into what looked like a spacecraft, which looked exactly like a spacecraft they'd seen a photo of when they were kids, but which they later found out was a hoax. So all the basic reality factors are canceled there. But there was an indistinction between a weather pattern and the phenomenon, which I think really plays into this idea that it could be atmospheric prana operating in different ways that are, you know, like who knows the complexity with which atmospheric prana could behave. There's no reason to think, but when you watch cymatic patterns, if you put like water or sand on top of a speaker, change the frequency and it makes these different geometric patterns, those sorts of seemingly super meaningful human phenomenon can be created by natural phenomenon under the right frequency conditions. Yeah. So there's no reason to think an atmospheric prana operating in interesting frequency patterns couldn't disrupt a search pattern or cause a vanishing, right? Now, whether yeah. or not it, how directly this hypothesis could interact with physical matter, right? Whether it could explain bodies and ships or bodies vanishing, I'm not sure. Let me indulge me the pleasure of taking this one step too far. All right. Would, <laughs> <laughs> would it be conceivable or palatable in terms of pranic swarming if that is real and is the case, totally extent factor interacting with the items and properties you just related might that be conscripted also by an ontologically distinct intelligence, you know, to use my biases, might a mantis entity understand pranic swarming and be able to conscript it for its purposes? Sure. There would be an initial ambiguity about whether or not you're encountering a phenomenon out of the, this subtle force or whether something else was acting through it. Because what do we know about regular electricity, right? It can do things seemingly on its own. We don't tell it to have a lightning bolt strike a tree. It just does that. But we yeah. can also make it do things for us. Make a radio happen, turn a light on. Yeah. So there's no limitation on the chronic swarm hypothesis, which says that there couldn't be entities or forces or intelligences making use of that phenomenon. And in like fact, gin. if it... If it interacts with biology and neurobiology, then you would think that to some degree, every organism is making use of it in some way. Mm. All the organisms we know and some of the organisms we don't know. Totally fascinating. Are you up for sharing any more of your experiences? 
Cause I'm like fucking full on in listener mode. Like I love, <laughs> I could listen to these all the live long day. One of the things, here's a really interesting one. Actually, it was on this island, Pender Island in British Columbia. And we'd, I'd gone over there to this guy's house and we had a party that night. At the end of the party, later in the night, we decided to all go walk down the beach. And there was uh, off in the distance. Now, this is from my memory. I haven't checked with them, any of them since, but we seem to be talking about it at the time. What I saw down the beach was like, if you can imagine a small Christmas tree with Christmas lights on it, but no Christmas tree, like just sort of a cone of different colored lights. It was down the beach. It was so strange, and it gave me that Christmas morning feeling. And I <laughs> posted, right? <laughs> and so I ran toward it down the beach, and I didn't get any closer. <laughs> right? So I don't know how long this went on for. I feel like I ran a long time and never got any closer. And so what I end up with is just a, a real strong impression of this luminous, magical feeling structure of multicolors with some kind of geometric form. Uh, and it doesn't change no matter how physically close I get to it. It's like running toward the horizon. That was a really interesting one. That's oh. one I, I kind of have no theory about except to say that, well, here's another interesting feature, you know, like, uh, McKenna, for example, and a number of those guys associate the DMT or other tryptamine molecules with the brain's capacity to access some of these perceptual frequencies. So, and we also have DMT endogenously in our brain. So we have a DMT spike in our neurochemistry every night. And I, if you wake up from a dream in which the DMT was spiking, it might have a different flavor, a flavor similar to smoking DMT or having an ayahuasca experience where the colors are a little bit more vivid, the forms are a little more archaic, so to speak. Anyway, when I was in my maybe late teens, early 20s, I would have a repeated dream, uh, which had the kind of vividness I associate with DMT experiences. And in this dream, I would, I would wake up, it was dark, I would go outside, and somehow I, it was my birthday. But then I noticed it was also Christmas morning. And then I also realized from some information about the world that the second coming of Jesus was also happening and that aliens had just landed and it was publicly known. Right? And it was, <laughs> and it was as if all these phenomena were versions of the same feeling quality. Mm. And they all had this sense of like Christmas morning times a thousand where the quality was so magically intense that all your normal assumptions about reality were suspended, right? And then the dream would go on and I became Jesus and floated up the magic tree and all these interesting things happened. But the, the, the main thing I took away from this recurrent series of dreams was the convergent flavor of these different interpretations that the second yeah. coming Christmas, your birthday, that there's a kind of experience a, a magical higher integration of all your possible experience at which this other set of perceptions becomes possible. Um, wow. Some of my, some of my waking state experiences definitely had that flavor and I'm not sure which causes, you know, does the experience cause the wonderment or does the wonderment key you into that perceptual frequency? Or do they Tetra arise? And yeah, that's two old. versions of the same thing. <laughs> yeah. That's fucking fascinating. You know, to what... <laughs> Have you had a saturation point where... How should I put this? To what degree do you retain any craving for more novel experiences? Or has that been sated and mm -hmm. your interests are now off in a different direction uh, th we're discussing a particular subspecies of novel experience uh, that used to drive me crazy. Uh, ever since I was a kid, uh, I had a real hard on for this kind of experience. Right? I would I would try to flash Morse code messages to the sky with a flashlight when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. I wanted I wanted it, and I don't know if that's because I remembered it from a place earlier in my life. Um, or whether I just heard about it and it sounded very me, but I was, I was ready. And when I had the experiences, none of them quelled the, 
thirst. <laughs> yeah. right? The thirst took the form of, I want more experiences and I want more interpretations of these experiences. I mm -hmm. need to know. But eventually there was a kind of a saturation with it, which is like, I'm still interested. I'm as interested in this as I am in anything, but it doesn't burn as much. It doesn't feel like I'm missing something as much. And I think that my focus has shifted to trying to generate or access a type of experience which gives me uh, a satisfying quality um, which supersedes my interest in that area, mm. right? And so when I'm not doing those practices, <laughs> then I fall back on my earlier life interests. <laughs> and what are those practices? Um, I would describe them broadly as the integration of subjective subsystems to produce a numinous coherent excess. And so like, uh, I have this theory that all spiritual experience and by analogy, religious experience, but all spiritual experience involves, um, a kind of harmonizing between different subsystems of the individual to the point where a gestalt excess is created, which we can then experience through a number of different modes. So mm. an example of that would be, um, practices where people are interested in heart, mind, and body. So you might say, if I'm working on something, if I'm working on it mentally, emotionally, and sensorily at the same time, or if even I'm just sitting in contemplation and I am aware that I have mm, thought possibilities and witnessing, I have emotional possibilities, even apart from the actual emotions I'm having, I have sensory and behavioral possibilities apart from my actual sensations and perceptions. That if I move through these and keep them all in the picture, and if I do that long enough, they kind of catch together and blend. And when they blend, it makes an overall intensification of beingness feeling. Mm. And this intensification in a classic integral way, right? I could see it as a self. I could see it as a phenomenon. I could see it as another. And then I have to do a second set of practices, which is how do I relate to this thing once it's been generated? <laughs> All right. And generally speaking, that this is what obsesses me at the moment is uh, how to get to that experience, where to go once you've got it, and how most, maybe all traditional inner practices could be deconstructed in a way that would be explained by this kind of process. Uh, and it's so, wow. it's so satisfying. <laughs> That my it previous sounds, sessions are in abeyance to some degree. That's so beautiful. And you should bottle it <laughs> and administer it to the tens and hundreds of thousands of us that are, I'm in a similar parallel process undertaking. Uh, but I do feel... I'm only half in jest when I say you should administer that to the millions of folks who are inevitably, if they are not currently, will be under the sway of these incredibly magnetic forces and what is ultimately could be characterized as the cosmic wild goose chase. It's so compelling. It's so, it's really that Christmas tree like object is almost the perfect metaphor I almost hesitate to call it a metaphor because you actually experienced it. But for the rest of us, a metaphor for what the nature of this whole undertaking and seeking process is in regards to this larger umbrella, umbrella of the paranormal. You might be a ghost chaser. You might be a contactee. You might have re repeated channeling. That just We know the canon of these items. And that wild goose chase, that Christmas tree that's ever magnetically exerting its seductive pull to you, and yet it recedes in perfect proportion to every bit of your advancement. I hear, I've experienced that over and over. It's a major theme in the last decade of my life. It's brought me to a place somewhat akin to what you're relating, which is the understanding that my passion and interest in more importantly, the degree to which I think these are relevant and profound issues for, for humanity and will continue to be for centuries. I do think there's something about our human experience here that we're going to have to grow into and that these 
riddles and puzzles are not going to deteriorate and evanesce as we move forward in the coming centuries. So I think that is a factor. And knowing that there's folks such as yourself that are so deeply engaged and in such intelligent and creative ways, birthing and bringing to bear new methodologies and new methodological pluralisms within their own life experience, that I think is the great hope. That's where we're going to find some modicum of progress, if possible, in the coming centuries. I still think that's why we're having these conversations. That's why I'm doing Aliens and Artists. That's why our, our integral tribe, the microcosm of our little integral tribe that's getting into the ring with this in this way, we'll continue to do that. And hopefully our little embassy will grow in that regard. And I think that's got to be done. And I also feel that integral delayed it a little while. And I wish that it hadn't perhaps, but it's pointless to lament that. So there's that side of it. On the other side, in the personal sphere in my life, the part that's parallel to what you just related, you know, I got to a point in the wild goose chase where I just didn't get to a sensation of like, I'm done with this and I'm going to divorce myself from it. It was more like, I need to find a way to do this work in which I simultaneously attend to the important matters of my kids and my wife and my dog and my relationships and my practices. What are my practices? How can I participate in a meaningful way into carving out and deepening my own interiors, but also more importantly, trying to find ways to be of service and assistance and form meaningful relationships so that the we can get really strong. And also the I thou, like the good part of this mystery that we're describing, the part that is not continually putting a mind fuck on us, the simple sacred presence that's available to us every day in our practices. I've been more about that than the last two years. And I would also venture to say that that was somewhat of a prerequisite to entering into making aliens an artist. Because as you know, every time we get in into the hot tub with another experiencer, there's a, there's a reactivation. There's like a romantic there's a little tiny bit of a retro romanticism, which is like, fuck, man, this shit's so hot. I almost want to run off into the desert on another fucking odyssey, right? <laughs> but don't. Like, yeah, have that exhilarating experience, but then get back to a sustainable approach to something more lasting and enduring that helps all of us if possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense from two sides. I mean, in the one, on the one side, there's this wisdom, which is no matter what experiences you've had, you've ultimately got to focus on how to integrate those experiences and integrate everything else in your life and do the practical work of trying to keep everything moving forward in tandem together so that they can collaborate into some higher quality of worthiness of life. Uh, but on the other hand, none of that means that we shouldn't be focusing on and incorporating these kind of experiences, that they're ancient and they're normal and we should be talking about them and that when people engage on them, they engage at a very high frequency and very rich density of meaning and that we should be um, trying to explore not only how they fit into our practices and our best philosophies, but also how they challenge those. I think there's a, there's a new and ancient religiosity here and how it pertains to say an integral map is very interesting. I've used the metaphor of, you know, you, you put your four quadrants you, on your lines and your states all on a carpet and there's a mouse under the carpet running around and he doesn't <laughs> care which quadrant he's in. The bump just moves around, right? <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. There's a sense in which there's something indifferent to our categories but there's also a sense of the convergence of our categories, right? If you imagine the four quadrants as the base of a pyramid or the four states as the base of a pyramid, there's a convergence that's possible. Yeah. And that convergence is, on the one hand, us trying to bring all the things in our actual life together in a workable way. And on the other hand, it's what we're shown by what seems to be entities who are better at the convergence than we are. Yeah. You know, McKenna spoke about the hyperdimensional object at the end of time. And whether that's at the end of time or whether it's 
facing us somehow in every moment. And what we have to do in each moment is bring together everything in this sort of the sense of the integrative spiritual practice I was talking about, try to get that sense of amplified being by bringing more things together. They all seem to reflect each other. It all seems to be about the amplification of being through a convergence point. And mm. our encounters with these entities present us with this convergence point, like my Christmas tree. You never get any closer to the horizon because perfect convergence is always the same distance away from you, but it's always saying the same thing, which is get to work, bringing all of your things together somehow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Get to work. It harkens back to my sole English message that I ever received from that mantis entity, which was remember who you work for. Well, I don't. <laughs> So, um, so I want to, we put a sticky note on an item earlier. Yeah. And I, I want to ask you, do you still have time? Do you need to? No, we can keep anyone? going for a while. Okay. Um, maybe this can be part of our last phase of confab. Um, we brought up hypnosis in regards to memory, the parts of memory which are available and quote unquote solid those which are slippery, amorphous, and subject to change, evolution. And then to import that to the realm of contact, abduction. I am a certified transpersonal hypnotherapist. I initially undertook that certification because I wanted to know for myself whether I wanted to undergo hypnosis in order to investigate my own experiences. And as we do oftentimes with anxiety and fear, trepidation, or just the unknown, I did it by proxy. So instead of investigating directly my own experiences, I said, why don't I take a year and just look at hypnosis? And perhaps via the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you have a, a proxy, by, uh, you experience some voyeuristically. Uh, that's a too pejorative because I was not treating these subjects voyeuristically, but just the idea of hypnosis as voyeurism where I was like, I'll look at it in second person for a year, figure out if this is something I want to do. And in doing that, I learned a lot. And beyond the learning, what I found compelling was not, can we use hypnosis in order to confirm or deny the historical events and experiences in contactees' lives? There seems to me to be the majority of conversation, at least, that happens in the UFO field around hypnosis is this idea or complaint, memories are unreliable. Hypnosis can be toxified by planted, in, you know, inadvertently implanted memories. The, a poor hypnotic guide can create a confabulation in the experiencer in which they'll imagine this whole alien abductee history which didn't exist in actuality. So it's not true. And then, you know, the funny notion is that hypnosis has been used in a forensic sense. Uh, there's many different points in history through the government, police, um, federal investigators and all that. Framing all of that up in that sense, I actually don't have a dog in that race. Like I never personally felt emotionally that anything was on the line for me, whether or not hypnosis could confirm a historical experience in my life or the life of the experiencer. I always thought of it as, can this person heal and would hypnosis help that? If they're traumatized and they are experiencing a life in which their day-to-day -day reality is disrupted, they can't hold down a job, their, their marriage is discombobulated, perhaps they wanna be a better dad or a person, those were the kinds of questions I was asking myself, which is like, if I have issues around my contact, would my life be improved by investigating them with hypnosis? And how much of that do I need to be true? Now, as a person beginning to do some of that work, that's the question I've carried forward. I've always felt like I feel more concerned about whether these people can heal than how 80% of their experience as a five-year-old in their front yard can be proven to be true. What's your take on this whole controversy? That's a really interesting question. And I, I 
worked as a, an Ericksonian hypnotherapist for a couple of years. Uh, maybe still do off and on, but <laughs> more directly for a couple of years. My sense is that um, hypnosis is indifferent to accuracy, that it has a much greater role to play in um, therapy than it does in memory. Uh, actually, there's, you know, um, I was thinking about your work on how encounter experiences influence artistic creation and the reciprocal of that, which is how artistry influences interpretations of encounter experiences. Because yeah, yeah. when I was a kid, I came across a few works of fiction that I locked in on. I said, that, that feels realistic, right? Philip K. Dick novels. I thought that feels realistic about my experience. And there was a guy named Darren Morgan who wrote three or four episodes of the X-Files. And his episodes, I didn't even know they were all by the same guy until years later, but I taped them. They were so good. One was called Jose Chung's From Outer Space, in which they go to a small town and everybody has a different version of the story. Clearly something happened. There's a government conspiracy, but there's something the government conspiracy is relating to that they can't understand. <laughs> Everybody gets hypnotized and tells a different story. They get re-hypnotized and tell a different story. And the different story is of them getting hypnotized previously to tell the story they first told, right? Like it's this Holy huge shit. tangle, right? So in the end, it all happened and nobody knows what it meant. And at one point, this author who's, that's the framing of the story. This author is trying to write a book about the event. And he says to Scully, what's your impression of hypnosis? And she says, it definitely has its therapeutic value, but it's never been proven to enhance recall. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that whole episode influenced me and reflected something I was already feeling in a lot of different ways. But that's my general sense is um, it can bring out some information that you haven't previously accessed consciously but there's just no way to tell when it's doing that and when it's inventing patterns out of information yes and the most important thing it can do is show you the patterns of your imagination the imaginal structures are available to you more through the hypnotic trance which is closely related yeah. to the shamanic trance yes that i think a lot of what goes on is that we have a subconscious intelligence and in the hypno hypnotherapeutic trance, the subconscious and the unconscious are put on the same plane together. Yeah. They can talk a little better. And your subconscious can help you out, help you focus, help you heal, help you recall things. And it doesn't, it's sort of indifferent to what really occurred in this lifetime. Yes. It might use some real data. It might make some shit up. It doesn't care about that. It cares about the way you feel and what you understand about yourself and how you can move forward. So I think it's much more useful than it is accurate, but it's very useful. That is such a great framing. That's virtually a hundred percent in accordance with my own experience and intuition. And there's a couple of features in there that might be fun for us to tease open a bit more as well, which is I love and have such a celebration for, the way that the subconscious is always 100% on the side of the healing of the whole self. So no one to my knowledge has encountered a subconscious, which is attempting to subvert and undermine or damage the whole self, the spiritual locus or center of the self. You don't find like typically, particularly in a hypnotic sense and working toward healing and integration, I just love the way that you can access the subconscious and it's just always there, always available in this particular type of endeavor, which is, hey, we have an issue, love to get your help on this. And then it pops forth with a host of new options, ideas, paths, modalities, just solutions that had not previously been available come to the fore. And there's always surprises in there. And I find that to be such a beautiful, fascinating aspect of creativity. Um, and then beyond that, in working with contactees, this, thus far I've, I'm finding these two lanes. Both lanes head to the same place, the same objective, which is healing, 
bringing to bear resources previously not available towards a deeper, richer, more gratifying life full of love and health. That's the objective. Both of these lanes go there. One of them is content free. So the person may come in and be say like, you know, I have these experiences. They're not explainable, but really the presenting issue is that my life is being disrupted by this. And what I'd like to have is a non-disrupted life with peace and happiness. Cool. That's our objective. And you go in, you do the work. And as you said, the historical accuracy, the details and specificity, undetermined, undeterminable. However, the healing that becomes available, great and effective. You get there in the end at that objective. Then there's this other lane where someone comes in with oftentimes a number, perhaps a lifetime of these mile marker posts where waking state conscious experiences are recalled and they're not ambiguous. So for instance, you're being whatever age and seeing, you know, let's fight aliens. And then that craft shows up, but it's not just your imagination. It's you and a friend. And then you intersubjectively confirm and that kind of complicated event or like I, broad daylight waking event, entity encounter, no drugs, no history of any kind of hallucinations or psychopathology. So that being the entry point, those people tend to have more of an interest of like, how the fuck can I resolve this waking state memory with what I know as reality and what is delivered to me as consensus reality? They tend to have a stronger desire to want to confirm the veracity of those as legitimate events somehow. But I find that tucked under there, the real point is still, how do you, the general resolution is how do we get to a good life of peace and contentment and coming back to what you and I described about the wild goose chase. If you're going to open one of those doors, you're going to see five doors and those five doors are going to lead to 50. That's the wild goose chase part of it, right? Which is why I still find that the satisfying objective is can we find healing and integration? Um, but the, the uh, more general part in the mix of this that I still wanted to get your take on is like, what is, you know, should we set aside the utility of hypnosis in relation to those waking state kinds of experiences when someone comes in with that presenting issue that's like, they think they want to talk about the fact that they saw a non-human entity in broad daylight, and perhaps it was a shared event or whatever. Is that something we should set aside as a viable application of hypnosis entirely? Is it a decoy ultimately for that healing? I think in terms of dealing with that person, you don't have to set it aside, right? Like you want to say, sure, okay, we're dealing with this, but we're going to frame it. We don't exactly know what's going to come out of this process. Maybe it's going to be access to some real memory phenomenon that fit in with this consciously. And maybe it's not, maybe it's going to be something that's suggestive or subconscious. So I think with that person, you want to be able to emotionally relate to them in the way that saying this process could very well <laughs> work with exactly what you're talking about with the kind of solidity of conscious narrative memory that you're hoping for <laughs> right now. There, there's no, there's no reason to exclude that form of relationship but we don't know what the process is going to bring forward if it brings forward something that's healing that would only be healing to that person if that person agrees to it and that person will only agree to it if they understand it's potentially possible that this is going to bring forward real memories and it is possible this is going to bring forward real memories it can be used to bring forward memories but we just don't know when it's doing that and when it isn't Yes, exactly. So I think there's a way of, of validating that kind of a person and using hypnotherapy to heal them uh, in a way that could easily do what they want, but from our point of view, doesn't have to do what they want. You know, yeah. the cognition is really interesting. There's an interesting, you know, the way Wilbur phrases it, which is that the cognitive line always precedes the other lines because you can't have an emotional response or an aesthetic response or a moral response to something whose reality you can't acknowledge. That's really, that's fantastic. It's a really good piece of yeah. philosophical logic, but 
it's a little bit ambiguous what cognition means, right? For some people, it's the intellectual, conscious, waking state recognition of a pattern. And for other people, it's our ability to work with some kind of pattern, whether we're able to phrase it to ourselves or not. Mm. And I think that the subconscious should be conceived as the main locus of integral development with the conscious mind, the conscious self-recognition and self-articulation of patterns as a sort of secretary or adjunct to that process. Yes, completely. And, uh, there's a, you know, Steve Martin has a great autobiography called Born Standing Up. Yep. And he was the first stand-up comedian to sell out stadiums. And he kind of had a, you know, he was smoking pot and it was the 60s and he got this sort of green meme turn on about how you could take comedy beyond the normal joke. And he decided he was going to just do set up and set up and set up, and people would laugh whenever they laughed. He wasn't going to do punchlines anymore. <laughs> build the tension, and you laugh when you laugh. <laughs> and that's my take on hypnotherapy as well. Because, mm. I mean, some people come to hypnotherapy and they want help with, I want to quit smoking. And you can go through a process that makes the ability – to have a flow state about not smoking easier than the ability to have a flow state with smoking. Fair enough. But that to me, that's not the exciting, sexy part about hypnotherapy. The exciting part is you bring up their subconscious and you hold them in a relationship to their subconscious and you let it do whatever it does yeah. because it's, it knows better than they do what they need from hypnotherapy and it knows better than you know. So you're mm. going to put them in that state at whatever it takes for them to get in that state, right? and that state could well involve accurate factual information, but it doesn't have to because it's themselves. It's the core of their values. If you can get them there, it will move them a step forward no matter what is their interpretation of the phenomenon. So beautifully put, and I, I concord entirely. I've always thought, not always, but since taking up hypnotherapy, as one of the praxis, I've experienced the subconscious as operating as that main cognitive cognition locus that you were relating. And I also agree with that framing totally, which is in some instances, it is mentation. That might be a more forward strength for an individual. But in others, and a lot with a lot of artists, it doesn't look like that at all. It looks like some prismatic refracting, refracting of this source origin of light and the subconscious seems to operate to me with the frontal structure on a need to know basis. It's so the con subconscious has it all, can be in cahoots with the unconscious and the frontal structure gets what it needs on a need to know basis. And sometimes it doesn't need to know much. <laughs> it's like other times it might be bestowed with a great inheritance and it might include factual past lives in Egypt or who knows? Yes, I, I agree also entirely that it does appear and feel and seem to present factual information, but it has no preference. If, it's, if the healing is going to be produced more fully and more readily by a, a totally imaginal geyser, that's what's going to be brought forward and what should be brought forward. And the authority of the subconscious is proven and validated again and again in that, in that regard. I find this other funny tendril in this realm is I'm sure that you spent a bunch of time, just like knowing our common forms of curiosity and things you probably got into in your life. I'm guessing you got into uh, Stevenson's research around near death and children recalling the uh, 20 cases suggested of reincarnation and the whole for, I don't even, maybe it's 50 years now at the university of Virginia where his successor has now carried it on. Anyways, thousands of cases, veridical cases, where uh, you know someone's born and under the age of four, they begin to recount all of these details of a previous life, and they this lifetime turns out to exist in a neighboring city, and they go there, and the way that this person had related dying turns out to be proved. They were shot in the head by so-and-so. That person's still alive. They go through this veridical process that's akin to some of the Tibetan uh, way of confirming a uh, reincarnation with a llama. They'll set aside the personal possessions they pick about. Anyways, thousands of cases like this. And I think the point being, if you take that plus near-death experience and 
there's a great host of literature available to us, which puts forth a real set of compelling data. That's available to all of us. However, you can't comport any of that with what goes on in hypnosis and, for instance, past life experiences within, within the hypnotic container. As we have this funny companioning between a growing field of near death and past life that seems to get more and more into the territories of veridical and there's a more robust population there. But here in hypnosis, someone having a past life experience, you know, it continues to be the most important measure is, did that bring to bear something useful and healing for them in their present life? And I do think the fascinating feature, like, my last question for this to you would be just as the hypnotherapist, did you assign any more sense of legitimacy or probable historical accuracy when the emotional presentation was much, much stronger? Like the demarcation being orders of magnitude stronger. Did that change your personal persuasion around whether it might not have had historical components? No, uh, but probably because the, the habit of my lifetime has been to bracket um, the reality of intensely felt and believed experiences, mm. right? So that I, you know, is this really happening right now? Yeah, <laughs> probably, but not conclusively, <laughs> right? That, that's... <laughs> That's how you, my, my, my sense is that's a, the post-formal approach in cognition to any phenomena. Everything's in brackets. Beyond the orange meme, everything's in brackets. <laughs> yeah. But do you, as you went on in life, this is a little bit of a different topic. No, not so much more in the hypnotherapy realm. What's your take on the ontological flooding that's become a bit of a fad? I don't want, maybe fad's pejorative, but that's, growing with a set of practitioners or as a sentiment in these various domains? Well, a couple of things. I think one is our media environment. And I think we, it's so new to have such a hypersemantic environment that our brains are not evolved to deal with tens of thousands of contradictory, potentially significant incoming cultural signals every day. Uh, it's just an overload. Uh, we need to um, immediately and very seriously go all in on the kinds of, say, Taoist practices that separate people from the meanings of symbols, right? That if you believe a news article you read, right? Or if, uh, this is what I always come down to, if a girl reads uh, that her friend said something awful about her on Twitter and she kills herself, is the problem that she had access to Twitter or is the problem that nobody taught her suspicion relative to incoming cultural information mm -hmm. and is that something that's a life and death issue to teach to kids now it's not a Taoist luxury it's a survival protocol in the hypersemantic environment mm -hmm. so part of it is we need to be much more wary of information than we are and ontological flooding in a sense is a, a premonitory understanding of how we have to relate to this flood of data that you cannot get on top of you have to have some kind of distance from and let in a bit at a time or else you're doomed. And then what the if you narrow, sorry, yeah. go ahead. The other hand would be the kind of McKenna thing, which is I, I feel, and I don't have a good uh, objective argument for this necessarily, but my feeling is things are getting weirder and they're getting weirder faster and bigger and that that's going to keep happening. And that the encounter experience is one prominent form of a kind of uh, collapse or transcendence of our basic ontological categories that is going to be coming faster and stronger as we move forward in time in a sort of accelerating fractal sense. And that this will be uh, traumatic if we're not ready for it and liberating if we are ready for it. That when you turn on the news every night, you should expect to go, what the fuck is happening? That yeah. that's the new normal. It's not going to go, right? Even if we elect Joe Biden and COVID goes away, we're not going back to normal. If each step forward in this process is going to reiterate an encounter with an overwhelming sense of peculiarity that sort of puts all of our knowledge into question. And I think that we have to treat that as the new reality 
and adopt practices that make us capable of sustaining and transforming that. Because if we compare that to what we hope reality is, we're going to get traumatized and fucked up and stray off course completely. To what degree would you make a distinction between ontological flooding in regards to high strangeness and the non ordinary further penetrating human experience as a rote variety of experience for the average person. That's, we've got that kind of ontological flooding over here versus chaos, the erosion of orienting principles in day-to-day life, including the media, civilization, pop culture. Are those two different orders and do we need two different kinds of tools when we're interacting with non-human entities and there's more of them pushing against our membrane, what's that set of tools in regards to ontological flooding versus navigating our way through this fuck storm of mayhem that is now every morning waking up in any country in the Western world? I don't know that they're fundamentally different. It might just be a difference in magnitude and recognition, right? Like there's... Um... Uh, the computational work of a guy like Stephen Wolfram, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he's got models which suggest that most possible computer algorithms, if left to run, go to infinite complexity like the digits of pi. So that almost every simple process actually connects to an incalculable uh, reality. And that this happens in every possible direction and that the math that makes up reality is mostly utterly incomprehensible, that it would blow all of our circuits to comprehend it. Now, we didn't notice that historically. Now we can run these computer simulations and we can notice it. It starts to stand out to us. And I think there's a lot of background weirdness in everybody's life that we just didn't notice before. Because these computations, if we go complex nonlinear computations, run to the point of absolute weirdness and that the society is building up by collective informational processes to some collective weirdness that we can't really process. How different is that from going out into the woods and beholding a strange plant, right? Because the geometries of that plant, you can't wrap your mind around it, especially if you took a drug or were in a meditative state before you went out there. You look at it, you go, holy, how can that be? This flower brings everything together, but I also don't understand it at all. And, you know, through meditative methods, if we look more closely at banal everyday experience and just the simple act of not knowing some ordinary thing in our lives, if you looked at that really microscopically, I think it would look like these huge forms of ontological flooding that we see. Mm. And that what we're doing is getting better at noticing that effect and that it was there all along, implicit in everybody's experience and pointed out periodically by mindfulness practitioners or shamans. And you think that that's a strength that's growing or that, you know, sometimes I wonder about if we have had an atrophy of some of our capacities in regards to the strange. When you think about strengths we had 12,000, 20,000 years ago and the real golden age of certain shamanic periods, which I don't know if that's imagined in my head. Of course, I don't know. I'm not there now. I'm living in this moment as myself. And so perhaps I'm completely inventing a notion that certain interior capacities to register this flooding that we're talking about in a flower or a tree or a a dog. I completely agree with the sentiment to really see any flower is absolutely that infinite conveyance Do you feel that that's getting stronger now because there's more meditators and we're getting a more sophisticated set of practices? Or did we lose it at some point? Has there been an atrophy? Or are both true? I don't know. I think they're both true. I think that there are many ways in which our ancestors had life circumstances which made it more likely that they would develop the individual capacities to handle this stuff. And that this is where the proto-esoteric lineages developed and that all of our religion and spirituality and yoga came out of those original cabals of people who, because they had psychedelic experience, because they were immersed in nature, because they lived in the normal way that human bodies are set up to live, 
And because they had limited cultural information and their capacity to integrate all of their cultural information was therefore higher, that they were likely to feel a sense of confidence and insight into how to handle these things that maybe we don't have as often today. But I also think that our ability to figure out how to do this faster and on a grander scale is stronger now than ever. I think that our, uh, let's say our computational ability to comprehend this weirdness and our intersubjective ability to talk about this weirdness, both of those are really accelerating forward. And we have to match that with our individual practices. And I think uh, we're having a conversation which we're getting better at talking about that. And that conversation could spark a tremendous acceleration. And I hope we'll do that. But part of that conversation is, what did we leave behind that we need to go forward with? Yeah. Affirmed. Yeah, because so much of it is, like we've been saying earlier in this conversation, so much of it is in the subconscious intelligence. Right? So much of it is uh, of our ability to make sense of the world is something that goes on before we notice. And we have to be able to bring that intelligence forward if we're going to handle this. Because we're now facing a situation our ancestors weren't facing, which is that we have to mm. handle the weird or we're fucked. <laughs> yep. I so love that sentiment about bringing it forward before the frontal structure understands. Because it accords with so much or nearly all of my artistic life and so much of the artistic lives of the creators that I admire and feel inspired by and am connecting with to form a organized, disorganized, organized, organized from the sub population in which to begin to cognize, but not through mentation necessarily or description, but bringing forth forward these artifacts and these creative experiences which exist and then in reflecting upon them with our frontal structure, we begin to, that part comes online and participates as well. I do find that to be thus far the way to, to get a foothold, to move a bit forward, whereas how many of us have derived real satisfaction from putting our personality as the project manager and letting it try to tackle the problem for a few years. That fuck, talk about a wild goose chase. You don't even have a goose. I think that a lot of this is going to show up in how we raise children, uh, which is to say that there's a, you know, the younger kids have a lot of access to subconscious intelligence and it hasn't been clearly differentiated from their socially informed conscious mind yet. And, you know, whatever the last several thousand years of human civilization has been, we've started to overpack the frontal self-recognition portion of the mind so that we ask people to switch at some age to be predominantly based on information that other people will recognize and that they can, you know, move forward in society in a good conscience with. And then if you're lucky, you're artistic, you're therapeutic, you run into the right bizarre entity or the right chemical or the right book, then you start to see these windows back into who you are underneath that psyche. But we have to be able to have children move through that phase in a way that doesn't just switch them over to a, a, a informationally stuffed foyer of the mind, right? So that uh, any of us yeah. like I do who are around kids in the house um, have to be trying to modulate their education in a way that helps them keep their nonlinear impressions of the world moving forward as they gain social skill, as they gain linguistic skill, so that they can inhabit our society with that subconscious mind right up at the surface, right? As, as well as we can see it, and as well as we might be able to transform ourselves to move the whole society forward in the face of accumulating weirdness, we need a lot of people to grow up in a, very, in a way that's, where their subconscious is extremely natural and reliable and not a weird thing that they have to reconnect with somehow. I completely concord with that. My wife and I, the bulk of our existence is about a strategy to create incentives and to some degree disincentives that counter and create the healthy 
path forward for our kids, which is in response to that larger outer consensus set of circumstances, which you just described, like overpacking the frontal structure. That is now so entrenched in so many facets of existence that unless checked and actively countered through really creative measures within a household, within a, a connection, a tribe of people, a mutuality, and whatever you want to think of it as, these little embassies that we build as practitioners together to create a different micro culture in which a new set of incentives are in place. And then it becomes completely normal for the subconscious, not only to be cultivated, you know, first of all, not to be discounted and dismissed as a fanciful fabrication of a quasi mentally ill person, which is a lot of what's out there, shockingly. Uh, but so not just that, but creating these positive incentives and environments in which the gratifying natural experience, going back to our ancestors 12,000, 20,000 years ago, or whatever, whenever that may have been, in which our native endowment as human beings that holds all kinds of contact points with the high strangeness and the non-ordinary, and but also just the limitless creative capacity of the imaginal in every individual and in every collective, like, I so agree that a household being about that. And funny enough, the pandemic, my house has always been about that. I don't mean that boastfully. It's not something noble we attained. It's more just that our dispositions and our constitutions are just naturally that way. You know, we're kind of fucking circus freaks. And so it's not a big leap for us. And I don't have face to keep as an academic or anything. I'm an artist. It's not been a big stretch. But funny enough, the pandemic and being quarantined for a year just we were able to put the pedal to the floor in this respect and just dive into <laughs> shit like my 16 year old daughter taking a year long exo studies course with Sean S. Bjorn Hargens, you know, getting vast tracts of time undistracted, unperturbed to cultivate a new body of artistic work that touches on all of these things that would never be admitted in any normal scholastic conventional matriculation. And so I second that with the most exuberant yes possible. And talking to you about it gives me a great sense of optimism. Do you have a great sense of optimism in that regard? I mean, maybe to put a button on this for us to conclude with, how are you feeling right now in terms I of the future in this question I'm, uh, by temperament i'm extremely optimistic about things you know i try to temper that uh with a, a sober calculation of the dangers that we face um but generally i feel like you know if you ever read nietzsche's first book the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music he describes the way that the golden age of greece blossomed out of the tragic age of greece and we look at socrates and euripides and this wonderful flowering but we don't look at the period before that that gave rise to it. And in that before period, it was dominated by these really pessimistic or tragic themes, he thought, right? But people enjoyed them. They watched all these dramas and people were taken out of prison to watch the great plays and then put back in prison. And in the great plays, all the heroes die at the end. All the great Greek protagonists fail and are destroyed, <laughs> right? <laughs> But they enjoyed it, right? He would talk about it the way we talk about a horror movie. You don't go to a horror movie to really feel fear. If you felt fear, you'd run out of the theater. You're actually feeling a kind of enjoyment that you describe as fear. Mm. And in the tragedy and the pessimism, you actually feel a kind of optimism that you are kind of ironically happy to describe as fatalist. And so I'm a bit like that, where I feel like I'm very, I'm very open to the idea that we're doomed but I feel pretty good about it. In fact, I feel so good about it, I think maybe we're not doomed. <laughs> <laughs> that's a truly, that's a nice note of doubleness to end on.